Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Will Pomeranz, and I am the director of the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. And it's wonderful to welcome our guests online and in person for what for sure is going to be an important conversation on the development of Central Asia from an economic and geopolitical standpoint. Before I begin, I want to remind our guests that this is conversation is on the record and is being recorded, as well as being cast out to our public audience. I also want to begin by thanking the International Tax and Investment Center, who have worked diligently to make today's program possible. In particular, I want to thank Ariel Cohen and Wesley Hill, who were instrumental in pitching the concept for today's conference to us and inviting many of the experts we, we will hear today. For those watching online, you can submit your questions to our speakers for either panel at Kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our fa Facebook page. We will pass these questions to the moderators. Finally, I would be remiss if I did welcome S. Frederick Starr back to the Kennan Institute. Uh, uh, Professor Starr was there at the, be crea at the creation of the Kennan Institute, along with James Billington and George F. Kennan, and served as the first director of the Institute. So we are so pleased that Professor Starr can join us today. Now I have the great honor to introduce our keynote speaker today, His Excellency Yerjan Ashikbayev, uh, the ambassador to the Republic of, uh, of the Republic of Kazakhstan to the United States. Prior to his appointment as ambassador, he served as the deputy foreign minister of the Republic of Kazakhstan from 2013 to 2021. As a deputy foreign minister, um, Ambassador Ashikbayev was Kazakhstan's diplomatic point person for matters of the United Nations and the Americas. Uh, he previously served as deputy head of the prime minister's office, head of, of foreign policy at the, at the office of the president, and head of the foreign cha minister's chancellery. He began his t diplomatic career in 1998 as a desk officer at the Department of Asia. He earned his bachelor's degree in international relations from Kazakh State University and his master's degree in public administration from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University in 2012. Ambassador Ashikbayev, the floor is yours. Very good morning, dear colleagues, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished panelists uh, and participants who are joining us today. And uh, many thanks uh, to Mr. William Pomeranz, the Cannon Institute, the International Tax and Investment Center for uh, hosting these uh, timely discussions. Uh, today's topic, uh, which is the future of Central Asia's development, is of essential relevance as understanding the complexity of dynamic political and economic landscape in Eurasia is even more compelling these days, especially when the long-standing rules-based international order becomes unpredictable. Well, we in Central Asia get a first-hand feel from complications between the great powers. Uh, and it's important to ensure a holistic approach, bearing in mind the nuances in the region, be it landlockedness, acute security challenges, ongoing national identity building, or uh, political and economic modernization processes. In a broader sense, we must draw upon fundamental principles of development of Central Asian states, enshrined in their respective supreme laws and constitutions, all five Central Asian countries proclaim themselves as secular and law-governed states with adherence to human rights, dignity, and freedom. And therefore, Central Asia's aspirations are in line with global development, not isolation, curtains, or restrictions. And uh, today's uh, 
geopolitical landscape is, of course, one of uh, the most troubling one in the world. And I should simply mention, uh, quote President Tokayev's, we cannot simply shrug our shoulders and agree with polarization and division. We cannot afford indecision or narrow interests detrimental to our collective good. Kazakhstan stands ready to cooperate with all relevant actors in the spirit of inclusiveness, multilateralism, and goodwill. Therefore, in the current circumstances, it's essential for both for Kazakhstan, but in a larger sense, I would say for each and every Central Asian country uh, to pay utmost attention to the development of constructive, predictable, and friendly relations with both our immediate neighbors, such as Russia, China, but also with our distant partners, with the US, United States playing crucial role. So uh, in, uh, the, in the times of uh, so many geopolitical tensions and uh, great power competition or uh, great power rivalry, our vision I should reiterate, both in Kazakhstan, but also increasingly in Central Asia, is to be neither a chessboard nor a field for great power contest, but rather a space of cooperation and progress, a space of synergy of the reactions. So these days, uh, unfortunately, to the date, Central Asia has been viewed through the different lenses, be it Caspian energy diplomacy, Iran, Afghanistan, counterterrorism, or something else. But to our understanding, it's of critical importance to regard Central Asia as a completely distinct individual entity and engage the region on its own terms. And it's uh, high time to address this deficiency by developing realistic and Central Asia-focused regional strategies. And we see positive steps on realizing uh, the need of uh, more tailored and coordinated actions, including within the G7. And uh, I would personally welcome the G7 commitment to act together on social economic development, implementation of domestic and institutional reforms, as well as fostering connectivity, transportation, trade links, and, and in some, uh, so many other areas of cooperation. And at the time when the Central Asian region undergoes three transformation process, it is important for us to pursue a strategy of hedging and building resilience to external shocks. The strengths of Central Asia is in its unity and cooperation and we have to unlock this potential. Kazakhstan has been a driving force behind so many uh, regional uh, economic integration initiatives, has been behind the uh, creation of many uh, Central Asia-wide dialogue platforms with uh, outside players, what is uh, commonly known now these days as C5 plus one plus EU plus uh, anyone <laughs> uh, platforms. Uh, but equally so, uh, we've been uh, a driving force behind uh, so-called consultative meetings of the heads of uh, Central Asia, uh, Central Asian nations. And uh, again, we reiterate that the future of Central Asia is not in confrontation or affiliation with some of the great powers, but rather in the synergy of uh, those relations. We appreciate the strong US support and would like to see even greater proactive engagement based on shared interests. Let me name a few. First, Intensifying high-level contacts. The recent visit by Secretary uh, Blinken was definitely a positive signal 
of the United States commitment to maintaining high-level political engagement with Kazakhstan and the entire Central Asia. And we would be delighted to uh, see even uh, greater uh, engagement, high-level engagement of the United States at a political level and host more U.S. cabinet members in our region. Secondly, there are many, I would call them low-hanging fruits that could demonstrate a clear political will on the side of the United States to the development of uh, relations with Central Asia. I would name the repeal of notorious jackson Venick Amendment and uh, recognizing permanent normal trade relations as a first one. I would also turn your attention to the need for the United States Congress Senate to ratify the protocol on negative security assurances to the Central Asian nuclear weapon free zone. And uh, uh, for a larger audience, I should uh, give an explanation that with regard to the protocol on negative security assurances, uh, other P5 countries have already not only signed, the protocol is signed by everyone. It's negotiated, it's agreed upon, it's signed by all P5, and it's ratified by uh, four of the five uh, nuclear powers. So uh, I would say there is a great, uh, great, great need, especially these days, a new strategical meaning of uh, institutionalization of Central Asian nuclear weapon free zone. And this could be done by a last final step, by the ratification uh, of this uh, protocol by the US, con by, by the United States. Thirdly, ensuring the equal and unbiased treatment to those countries that comply with sanctions policies providing a level playing field for all stakeholders. And let me reiterate that Kazakhstan remains fully transparent with uh, our American, European, uh, UK partners being committed to ensuring sanction compliance and uh, uh, equally not facilitating sanctions evasion. Uh, and there are plenty of uh, uh, cases that uh, needs particular attention of the, uh, not only sanction authorities, but uh, uh, decision makers on the US side, on the European Union side, on UK side, and uh, some other sanctions imposing authorities to uh, think of Central Asia not, and Kazakhstan, of course, not only in uh, purely legalistic terms, but understanding the broader context. Uh, at the end of the day, if uh, the quick look uh, on a political map would uh, reveal that Central Asia is encircled by sanction, sanctions hit jurisdictions, and it's extremely, extremely difficult uh, uh, issue for Central Asians, uh, it's a matter of, I would say, even uh, economic survival. Uh, among other steps, I would name uh, supporting OECD aspirations of Kazakhstan in this regard. Uh, those uh, plans are still with us, and we very much hope of uh, joining this club. It's, it has uh, uh, a great meaning in terms of bringing standards, best practices, uh, unified approaches uh, in both domestic, economic, social, political uh, areas to Kazakhstan and uh, uh, to a wider region because uh, uh, being the biggest landmass and uh, the uh, economic powerhouse in the region, Kazakhstan has always been a champion of change, pioneering new ideas and initiatives aimed at enhancing the 
uh, economic connectivity, interregional cooperation, and overall positive change in the heart of Eurasia. Uh, let, me, uh, let me also uh, dwell on uh, the political modernization processes in Kazakhstan. Uh, we highly value the U.S. leadership in defending democratic values worldwide, embracing an affirmative vision and supporting emerging democracy. And uh, the U.S. support is crucial for our regional development as both Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, since uh, we have uh, Uzbek ambassador uh, coming, uh, are implementing comprehensive political reforms. And uh, 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 what, a timely, what a timely entry, uh, ambassador. So uh, in less than a year, Kazakhstan witnessed several uh, electoral campaigns, including a referendum, direct election of rural governors, presidential and parliamentary elections, a new composition of the majlis of the lower house of Kazakh parliament uh, reflects a broad spectrum of ideological views. An opposition party has entered the parliament and uh, the election campaign showed that social lift works and every citizen can be elected to the parliament as uh, one third of the parliament is now elected uh, through uh, the, uh, uh, not through the patelists, but uh, uh, through uh, the individual uh, uh, representation elections. So uh, all of these changes are aimed at reshaping our political order and leaving behind the super presidential system, which is, in our view, no longer effective governance model for our nation. And let me also stress that uh, uh, Kazakhstan now, have, now has a single seven-year presidential term, which is unique in our part of the world and which is a, a statement, a political statement of uh, what uh, Kazakhstan's future going to be. So I've, I've reiterated uh, several times that we seek a synergy of individual and collective efforts managing potential risks and disruptive consequences. And it's clear that in an increasingly polarized world, Kazakhstan uh, intends to play the role of bridge builder between east and west, uh, south and uh, north. And this is a product of our unique history and geography. Starting from the ancient Silk Road for centuries, Kazakhstan has been a crossroad of different civilizations, cultures, and religions. It still remains valid nowadays when we talk about middle corridor that connects Central Asia, Caucasus, and Europe. While it contributes to enhancing regional connectivity, it's also building resilience in terms of uh, energy security, supply of strategic goods, and expanding trade flows. It's a win-win project for building sustainable supply chains and increasing cross-border trade. And let me uh, finish again with a quote from President Tokayev, uh, who said that at times like this, we need to build bridges, not walls. In pursuant to advancing both confidence and trust, Kazakhstan is committed to championing dialogue, trade, and global cooperation. I thank you for your kind attention. Good morning, everyone here in Washington, DC, and hello to all of our viewers abroad. My name is Wesley Alexander Hill. I'm the International Program Manager and Lead Analyst for the Energy Growth and Security Program at the International Tax and Investment Center. We're very thankful again to our colleagues at the Kennan Institute at the Wilson Center for hosting us. I will be the moderator for this first panel. Uh, all of the biographies for all of our esteemed panelists, both the first panelist and or first panel and the second panel, can be found online. And if you are in the room, can be found in the packet in front of you. 
I do not want to waste anybody's time by reiterating and failing to explain properly how esteemed our panel is. So I will just begin uh, right away by setting, by turning this over to Ambassador Hoagland. So Ambassador, I was hoping that you could set the stage for recent geopolitical developments in Central Asia for our audience. Fine, from here. Okay, thank you very much, Wesley, and I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, I very recently have traveled throughout the region uh, with Dr. Marsha McGraw Olive. We were in uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan at the end of March, and then just two nights ago, I returned very late at night from a week long trip to the other side of the Caspian Sea uh, to uh, Azerbaijan. What I would like to do is give a little bit of the background that some of you may already, most of you know pretty well, but the role of Russia and China in Central Asia. Each of the five countries of Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, you know them all, each one keenly va values its own sovereignty. From nearly the beginning of their independence, more than three decades ago now, each in its own way has practiced what Kazakhstan first called multi-vector foreign policy, meaning that they work to balance their relations with Russia, China, the European Union, and the United States. Now, the elephant in the Central Asian room, or maybe I should say the growling bear in the Central Asian room, has always been Russia. From early on, Moscow more or less tolerated Beijing's growing influence in the region, but did everything it could to try to influence, uh, try to limit the influence of Brussels and Washington. However, Putin's criminal war in Ukraine, now in its second year, seems to have shifted how Central Asia sees and more importantly, deals with Moscow. Not one of the five countries has supported the war and several have sent significant humanitarian assistance to the people of Ukraine. Even more recently, on April 26, Kazakhstan voted yes on the UN General Assembly resolution to condemn Russia for Putin's criminal war in Ukraine. As a footnote, I'd also note that Armenia voted yes, and that's even more surprising. But it gives you an idea of how things are shifting at this point. Now, if Moscow is the elephant in Central Asian room, Beijing has become sort of the metaphorical daddy war bucks flashing around money for China's Belt and Road Initiative that in the region is increasingly known as the Middle Corridor. This provides transit from China to Europe without going through Russia. During a very recent trip to Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan with the Caspian Policy Center, all of our interlocutors expressed cautious approval of China's current role in the region. One specifically noted that Beijing, unlike Moscow, does not put ideological pressure on the Central Asian governments. He explained that even if China sides with Russia in public, it's highly unlikely that Beijing approves of Moscow's war in Ukraine, and certainly does not, Beijing does not suggest to people in Central Asia, even behind closed doors, that Central Asian leaders should accept the war. He added, that he was pleased that Chinese diplomats consistently emphasize, both in public statements and in private conversations, the importance of territorial integrity. And he stressed that this sends a welcome message to the governments of Central Asia. Now, I'd like to look just a little more closely at the roles of both Russia and China in independent Central Asia and the institutions that they have created for their presence there. Russia has long declared Central Asia to be its privileged sphere of influence, and at times Putin has gone so far as to say exclusive sphere of influence. Um, this is because of the history, the economic ties, the colonial lingua franca of the Russian language, the Russified culture of the elite, 
and because of a tsunami of propaganda on the Russian broadcast media that blankets Central Asia. You would think that Russia has a near dominance there, but it doesn't. Each Central Asian state jealously guards its independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, and even more so, ever more so, since 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea from Ukraine. That was a game changer and even a wake-up call for the Central Asian governments, and we began to see their positions slowly, slowly shift, even before Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia has created two multilateral structures for regional integration. The first is the Collective Security Treaty Organization, known as the CSTO, in which the members uh, pledge to support and defend each other's mutual security. Now, despite annual summits and fairly regular military exercises in the region, the CSTO is still not seen as an especially effective organization either by its members or more broadly in the greater Eurasian region. It's useful to note that during Kyrgyzstan's ethnic turmoil in Osh that began all the way back in 2010, Bishkek did ask for security assistance from the CSTO, but Moscow did not respond. It was only during the massive economic protests and simultaneous attempted coup d'etat in Kazakhstan early in 2022 that Moscow finally did deploy a relatively small element of the CSTO to help a member country. But by that time, things were almost under control and they stayed only a few weeks. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the other Russia-dominated multilateral organization in the region is the Eurasian Economic Union. This comprised initially Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, but now also includes Kyrgyzstan and Armenia, with Moscow putting pressure on the other countries in the greater Caspian region, like Tajikistan, to join. Tajikistan is arguably the weakest and poorest state in the region, but it has responded to Moscow only lukewarmly, so far neither saying yes or no. Historically, Kazakhstan's first president, Nursultan Nazarbayev, actually proposed something like the EEU in the early 1990s. But Moscow tended to poo-poo it until Putin's third presidential term, when he apparently saw it as a potentially effective tool of what was called at that time Putinism, and which some went so far as to call neo-Sovietism. Many suspect that Moscow sees the EEU as a block structure led by Moscow that will inevitably take on political dimensions. So far, however, Kazakhstan has politely said yet to any political dimension or to go even further to a common currency which has been raised from time to time. Now, why would Kazakhstan do this? Because it rigorously guards its independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, especially since its population, unlike the populations of the other four Central Asian states, is still just about 25% Slavic. And, it's con and this population is concentrated largely in the northern part of the country bordering with Russia and around the former capital, now the business capital, Almaty. It's especially the north that concerns Astana and why Nazarbayev moved the capital of his country from Almaty to what was known at that time as Brezhnev's virgin land city of Tselinograd on the steppe in the middle of nowhere. That was because from the 1990s to this very day, influential voices in Russia have continued to call for the annexation of the northern third of Kazakhstan that some insist was always historically part of Russia. And even just a few months ago, Putin himself 
shrugged and said, he's not sure if Kazakhstan exists. It does exist, I assure you. Now, China is the other contiguous neighbor of Central Asia that bears watching closely. China's presence in Central Asia has generally been politically benign as it has sought to gain access to the hydrocarbon and mineral wealth there to fuel its own economic growth. Even as China increasingly bought into the oil sector of Kazakhstan and the natural gas sector in Turkmenistan, where it is the only foreign nation allowed to operate its gas wells and pipelines on Turkmenistan's sovereign soil, the West, including the United States, saw no problem with that because there was no perceived political threat from China to the United States. The West, however, perked up its ears when China's President Xi Jinping announced at Nazarbayev University in Astana in September 2013, something that at that time was called the New Silk Road Economic Belt, running from east to west across Central Asia and on to Northern Europe, which we now very recently begin to refer to as the Middle Corridor. Initially, the United States, with its own New Silk Road initiative at that time, paid little attention because the US version of the New Silk Road focused on forging north-south links from Russia's southern border into India, where China's stated goal was to facilitate transport of its industrial production, especially from Western China overland to Europe. China, as we now know, was making it up as it went, as all countries do, and by 2014 had mostly formulated and finally announced what it then was calling its One Belt, One Road initiative that went far beyond Central Asia to include elements in Pakistan, Southeast Asia, and maritime lanes through the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean to all littoral ports, including those of East Africa. Now, the initial US view of China's New Silk Road economic belt was rather simplistic. We said, eh, they do hardware, we do software. Meaning that Beijing would probably focus, we thought, on upgrading the east-west highways and rail lines in Central Asia, while Washington focused on the technical capacity of building for things such as customs modernization and border security. As China developed its Belt and Road Initiative, as it is now called in Central Asia, it became apparent that China was actually creating more of an industrial investment scheme in part to stimulate economic growth among its nearest Western neighbors. Near the end of 2014, US diplomats met for the first time with appropriate contacts in Beijing to compare notes on each other's new Silk Road policies. And for full disclosure, I have to admit that I led that delegation to Beijing. Those initial meetings in Beijing were friendly and to some of the participants and observers, surprisingly forthcoming. But they only scratched the surface. Beijing said, please come back and we'll talk further. So in May 2015, again in Beijing, we presented to the government of China a short list, a menu, if you will, of possibilities for concrete cooperation in Central Asia. Now, not much of it came at that time, in part, it seems, because China was not really sure of US intentions, and probably more important, because China had already nominally allied its new Silk Road economic belt with Russia's Eurasian Economic Union. Because US policy was not fully invested in seeking Chinese collaboration in Central Asia, Washington let these initial attempts fall by the wayside. And yet, the potential certainly did exist at that time for Sino-American cooperation in Central Asia if both sides had followed through. 
Now, more broadly, the China-dominated Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or known as the SCO, plays a certain role in Central Asia, certainly more so than the Russia-dominated CSTO. For many years, the SCO was seen by outsiders and even by some participants as just one more talk shop. Soon after the SCO was founded, member state Uzbekistan recommended that the United States be granted observer status to the SCO. But before the SCO could decide on this recommendation, Washington abruptly rejected the offer because it was unwilling to be associated even as an observer with an organization comprised of Russia, China, and the unreformed former Soviet states. This rejection was perhaps understandable, but it was short-sighted and typical of the ideological decision-making in Washington. While it still does play a very concrete role in Central Asian states' policymaking processes, the SCO has established itself now as a basically non-threatening and even respected international organization in Central Asia. So with that, I'm sure my time has gone over. Um, there's more to say on Russia and China and Central Asia, but I would certainly welcome your comments and questions when we have that time a little bit later. So thanks very much to all of you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I would like now to turn to our other ambassador joining us for this esteemed panel, uh, Ambassador Abu Setov. Uh, ambassador, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, great. Well, we would re really appreciate you uh, addressing- Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Ambassador. Uh, we would really appreciate your, uh, your opening remarks and to set the stage for local views on many of these issues that were just brought up. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me for this very distinguished uh, event. And uh, uh, I am very pleased to be with you this morning. And, uh, and I, I'm very thankful to, to organizers and the International Tax and, tax and Investment Center, and uh, as well as to Canon Institute for hosting this event. But mostly I would like just to, to, to say my deep appreciation to the authors of the, this paper, which in my understanding, uh, uh, a real foundation for our discussion today. And this morning, I mean that Kazakhstan could lead Central Asia in mitigating the world's energy and food shortage, which has been done by uh, Margarita Asenova, Dr. Cohen, and Wesley Hill. And uh, I'm, I'm absolutely very happy that this might, in, maybe in my understanding, this is the first time when in one bus you put the, 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 the issues concerning the world energy and concerning the food programs and agriculture, especially concerning the Central Asia region. In my understanding that the, 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 that the, the experts from the West, for example, the understanding of uh, that this part of the world, I mean Central Asia and Kazakhstan, be already becoming substantial part of the world is coming today for, uh, uh, for the Western, uh, Western European and American experts. This is absolutely very important. Because in many cases uh, that uh, we need to discuss uh, the, the, the whole issue in the geopolitical situation, what we have in the region, for example, and the world, which is changing with, uh, with the highly kaleidoscopic uh, uh, fasting fast. And uh, in my understanding that maybe I, I would like to put attention to three very important elements. First of all, the, it was already mentioned by multi-vector foreign policy. In my understanding that uh, multi-vector foreign policy, I am trying now when I was retired to think and rethink what, what it was and uh, what, uh, what, what was the development of this phenomena as multi-vector foreign policy of Kazakhstan during the last 30 years. First, firstly, the, the, the multi-vector foreign policy coming from the, not from the geopolitic, it's coming, it came with political geography. Because as you know, 
the location of Kazakhstan between two giants, nuclear weapons giants, and we have to produce, first of all, the, trying to find a, a, a balance uh, between our relationships with, uh, first of all, with these two uh, very important neighbors. And uh, it, it, was a f it was the first stage of thinking and coming to the multi-vector foreign policy. And after that, the second um, element, which is extremely important in the elaboration of the multi-vector for, uh, foreign policy philosophy and phenomena, it was the indivisibility of security. Indivisibility in the in the in the region in the world in, in, as a world policy as a as a regional level and the, between the national security and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that the, uh, this collaboration of these two elements of these two, uh, if I may say, substantial points, uh, they give the impetus of the elaborating and the find the way how to produce this multi-vector foreign policy. Because of this one, and that's why so uh, we, 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 during this period of time, believe uh, me, it was uh, extremely important to understand what we have to be uh, uh, and uh, what, we, what we have to present the country as, as a new country of the world community. And the firstly, it was the, if I may say, the business card of our country, it was the, our position and the nuclear weapons. Uh, um, um, direction, because as you know, so the fourth arsenal uh, of the nuclear weapons were located on the territory of Kazakhstan, and it was the it was the one of the extremely important decision, uh, which was started by the decree of the first president of Kazakhstan, uh, uh, Nazarbayev, to close the simple atoms nuclear test testing site. Until now, uh, we uh, take in consideration. The, the, the last events of this particular, particular area. Many countries and many uh, world leaders, they're saying about the Kazakhstan as a champion uh, uh, in this particular uh, direction. I mean that non-proliferation and nuclear disarmament. And uh, uh, today uh, we, we, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, and uh, my previous speaker and the previous speakers mentioned already too that uh, uh, it's it's absolutely a new situation in, in the in the world's geopolitical because in my understanding that the real situation now is much more aggravated is much more complicated than it was during something like during the, the, the period of time of the collapse of the Soviet Union for example uh, today is uh, 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 not only uh, um, uh, rattling. Today, the military action is taking place in our region, practically in, in, the, in, the, in the region of every Asia. And the, today, we have the, the using the wording, and the, for example, of nuclear weapons, not only as, because in the military doctrine of uh, in, uh, of the uh, practically of all P5, including the United States and the, and the Russia, it was as a, as a means for 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 defense. Now it, it, it absolutely another story, and uh, for us extremely important now. Uh, just and uh, uh, today, as you know, so it was the uh, um, it was declared that the new elements and the new concept of foreign policy of Kazakhstan now is on the way of elaborating. And I hope that the all, uh, um, uh, all issues and the all events, all, all directions or all phenomena which are taking place now in the world policy, including regional policy, including the philosophy of the, of the, uh, philosophy of the multi-vector policy, uh, will be uh, taken into account uh, properly and rightly. Because for my understanding and my feeling is we have to find a way in this extremely different situation what we have something like maybe 30 years ago to preserve the philosophy of multivectorism, to preserve the philosophy of multivector foreign policy. And in my understanding, it will be just the only way for my country and the region as a whole to go further and to strengthen uh, uh, the, um, uh, the abilities to, 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 to be um, a country um, uh, for prosperity and, de and development. Because uh, uh, 
my thinking is that uh, you, 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 we have said about many things concerning that uh, the the nuclearization of Kazakhstan and the, and the, and the other and the, and we and the, what we have to do in the future, for example. But moreover, now it's absolutely extremely important to understand the agriculture. And the, some, when I was retired and then joined the foundation of the Nasrallah Nazarbayev Foundation, I, I just pre uh, prepared a paper of agricultural development or agricultural development not only in Kazakhstan but in the region as a whole. And I proceeding from the understanding how to preserve and to strengthen the regional security and the national security of Kazakhstan. Because for Kazakhstan, we, we have the ninth territory in the world. We have absolutely very uh, good traditions, which comes to us from the centuries and centuries ago, cattle breeding. We have the, which was done something like maybe five or six decades ago, the wheat produced. That's why, so for this time being, we already have the good, very two belt to produce a, 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 a cattle breeding belt and the wheat producing belt. For my understanding, and, the, and the, it, 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 such kind of the producing, it may found it on the way uh, and producing on the way of the green field concept. This is extremely important. For Uzbekistan, for example, we have the big, big opportunities for the cotton belt, producing a lot. For example, uh, Kyrgyzstan, they, because it means that, uh, in my understanding, that agricultural development and agricultural interconnection in the Central Asia, it will be a very good base for creation in future, the Central Asian Union. And to be one of the, if I may say so, um, hub to, for producing a, 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 a very high quality agricultural, uh, agricultural products, not only for the region itself, but the whole Euro-Asian continent. It means that we have more and more chances to preserve our security, not only in the region, but in the world. And uh, as you know, so the President Nazarbayev, he uh, proposed such kind of idea, of idea of the Central Asian Union, something like that, the early uh, 2001, 2002, something like this. And, uh, but unfortunately, during this period of time, it was not uh, 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 um, made uh, appropriate understanding because uh, in, in, in the, um, uh, um, the main concept of the President Nazarbayev, it was the, 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 to, to provide a good uh, partnership or to good the competition, but not the rivalry. But some countries of the region, they, uh, uh, the, uh, they just look to this particular initiative as a as a, um, uh, efforts or camp of the Kazakhstan to, to, to be a champion in the region. But for this time being, the, the situation is changing. And uh, it, 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 it will be very, because as you know, so one of the very important elements of the security of this, of Central Asia and Kazakhstan is, is, this, is a elaboration and establishing Central Asian Union, taking into consideration what we have in, 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 uh, from from our from our big neighbors, and uh, I'm I'm thinking that uh, it will be a good opportunity to do so in the way how we may to produce a good base and a good foundation to 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 stand uh, and to live in more secure and more uh, uh, prosperous way to find a way how we will go further with the Central Asian Union. And uh, my understanding that President Tokayev understands this very, very important. And uh, today, as you know, so uh, he, he did a lot in order to, uh, to establish a very good relationships with our, with our neighbors, especially with Uzbekistan and, uh, and uh, as well as another Central Asian countries in order to find the way. But my thinking is that agriculture, and uh, if we we'll united our efforts in the sphere of agriculture, it will be a very good objective base for establishing such kind of feeling. I am stop here in the maybe at late stage if it will be the questions or some I mean I will be very pleased to to, 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 to discuss it further. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. Uh
Let's now turn to Dr. Bakari on the panel. Uh, Dr. Bakari, can you please tell us more about the security issues confronting the region? Thank you, Wesley. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here amongst distinguished guests and uh, colleagues uh, to offer my thoughts. So uh, bear with me as I am the bearer of some good news and some bad news. Uh, okay, let's, let's start with uh, Russia. Uh, and, and, and I'd like to sort of project moving forward as to where do we go from where we are right now uh, on each point that, that I will touch upon. And I'll try to do a 360 uh, of the strategic environment of Central Asia uh, before I dive into um, each individual state and where it is. So uh, we, the United States is in a conundrum uh, with regards to the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, on one hand, uh, we want uh, to end this uh, invasion of, of sovereign Ukraine territory and bring this conflict to a, an, uh, a, a, a conclusion that is in keeping with the aspirations of the Ukrainian people, which is that you know no part of their territory remains under occupation. Uh, so that's sort of the ideal outcome. Uh, on the flip side, if you swing the pendulum uh, you know, to the other end, one of the risks is that if we push too hard, uh, then Russia can destabilize. Uh, at least the Putin government can destabilize. What that looks like is anybody's imagination. Uh, but we have the, the collapse of the Soviet Union as sort of like a measure by which to sort of try to game that out. Uh, I will desist from that right now. But suffice to say that at this point, that, that is the challenge. Why is that a challenge? Because uh, if we know Russia as it currently exists, uh, if it were not to operate in its current form, then we're dealing with massive uncertainty. Uh, you know, it's a nuclear weapon state. If it's destabilized, it has implications for its entire near abroad, including Central Asia, particularly Kazakhstan, which, with which it shares a very, very long border, the second largest border in the world. Uh, so we, we need to be able to, you know, somehow extricate Ukraine from this conflict and at the same time not have unintended consequences. That's sort of, you know, where we stand right now uh, with regards to the conflict in Ukraine. Another corollary effect of the, uh, is uh, not just the weakening of uh, Russia, but the weakening of Russia in the Black Sea Basin. What does that look like? What does that mean? We've already seen a glimpse of it, and prior to the uh, Ukraine conflict, in the form of the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh War of 2020 and, and, and the destabilization uh, that took place. We have a new normal there where Azerbaijan has the upper hand uh, in the NK conflict, uh, backed by Turkey. Turkey has aspirations to fill the strategic vacuum that is slowly being left behind by uh, Russia, uh, and it has implications. Uh, for now, it seems like what's happening, and if this can be stabilized in the South Caucasus, that conditions have become ripe for the Middle Corridor, uh, where Azerbaijan uh, can serve as sort of that transit state, bringing in uh, energy resources from Central Asia, as well as minerals. Uh, obviously, the corridor needs to be built, but the geopolitical underlying security conditions seem favorable. Will they remain that way? We don't know, um, and, and I don't want to bet on it. Uh, so, so there is that. Um, if we move swing towards the east, uh, we have uh, China, uh, and, and the Chinese are in a, a, a sort of weird spot uh, where all things being equal, a receding Russian footprint in, the, in, this, uh, in Eurasia is good for China. China can go in and fill, especially it, because it has the financial resources that the Russians do not have. Its problem, though, is that uh, the Chinese have uh, a strategy that's based on, on two dynamics. Number one is that uh, it relies on other powers to be able to maintain security while it engages in what we can call you know, geoeconomic activity. Uh, the biggest example is uh, 
if you notice between 2013 and 2021, when the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan, that's the time period in which the Chinese built the BRI in South Asia, particularly in Pakistan, but also in Central Asia, particularly in Kazakhstan. Uh, that was made possible because the United States was making sure that anything and everything that happens in Afghanistan stays within its borders and does not affect uh, or disrupt the region. That's no longer the case. How Afghanistan will evolve, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, aftershocks will happen with the rise of the Taliban to power, what does the Taliban regime look like moving forward, and what, how does that impact the region is something to uh, consider. Uh, and so, therefore, the Chinese plans are, uh, you know, mired by uncertainty as far as BRI is concerned. Uh, the other aspect of the Chinese strategy is that the Chinese go into states that are relatively weak uh, or relatively sort of, um, if you will, where China can have its way. Uh, the assumption there is that the state remains within uh, a certain amount of uh, coherence, if you will, so that the Chinese can you know, have their cake and eat it. Uh, but it's not panning out, as we're seeing, given you know, all uh, the, the debt that is mounted. We've seen this happen in Sri Lanka. Pakistan is next uh, in line. Uh, and, and the business model of the Chinese isn't working out. Uh, at some point, uh, you know, China has to sort of uh, move beyond the Uyghur issue as well. The Uyghur issue is important from a Central Asian point of view because all Chinese ambitions in Central Asia uh, rest on that. The Chinese can only go so far into Central Asia to the extent that Xinjiang is pacified and remains pacified. Um, and, and given what's happening in Afghanistan, you know, th this is a major worry of, of the Chinese. Um, but I think that sort of, you know, one of the other components that is most disturbing is, is sort of the, uh, the meltdown that's taking place in Pakistan. Uh, and that has implications uh, for Central Asia because then if you're in Central Asia, you're not just worried about Afghanistan. You're worried about instability having strategic depth further southwards in Pakistan. And so you have a contiguous sort of battle space in a worst case scenario. That... Uh, is going to, sh the outcome of what happens to Pakistan uh, will also shape the future development, uh, future prosperity, security uh, of the Central Asian states. Um, then let's pivot uh, further west and you, you have Iran. Uh, Iran is undergoing massive change. What will it look like, uh, you know, one, two, three years out, is anybody's guess in this time frame, uh, you know, it is likely that uh, the supreme leader of Iran uh, will either be on his way out or will be out uh, from political office because of his age and because of his health conditions. What does an Iran look like post Khamenei uh, is another issue uh, that will have to be dealt with. It has implications uh, for the entire region, that the many regions that surround uh, that that you know surround Iran. Uh, obviously, it has more stakes in the Middle East, but there are implications for Afghanistan uh, and, and, of course, for Central Asia, uh, particularly given you know, the, uh, the efforts to build the north-south trade corridor while we talk about the middle corridor. So this is sort of the, the strategic 360-degree environment uh, in which uh, the five Central Asian nations exist. Uh, and it, it suffice to say that they are operating in a strategic environment that is undergoing historic proportions of geopolitical churn. Uh, let's drop down altitude and look at each individual country for a, briefly for a moment. Uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are in, in the middle of massive uh, political economic transformation. Uh, it, and this is all happening in the context that I just laid out. So it's not just the environment, it's there are internal changes. Uh, it is when you're uh, in the process of uh, transformation of this scale, uh, it, you know, it's a risky proposition. Uh, how things look on the other side is difficult to tell right now, but it, it is uh, worth mentioning that uh, it's, go it's going to be uh, a, a, if you will, 
not so much of a smooth ride because a lot is riding on the decisions that are made in Astana, the decisions that are made in Tashkent, how that uh, transformation moves forward. Uh, you, you know, you, it, the, the key thing here is that if you offer political freedoms, uh, which is a good thing, uh, there could be unintended consequences where the demand for political freedom is far more from the masses than uh, you know, the states are willing to offer. And how do you balance? How do you find the right equilibrium? This is not easy. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, if we take a moment to look at it, has gone through three uh, uprisings since 2005. And given all the fragility in the region, how uh, political events take place in that country and you know its border with China, uh, it's, it's another piece of, of the broader puzzle that needs to be uh, kept in mind. Tajikistan, in my opinion, is probably the most vulnerable to everything that's happening, particularly because of its long border with Afghanistan uh, and particularly because of its heavy dependency on uh, the Kremlin uh, militarily and, of course, uh, from you know, the remittances that expat Tajiks send home. Uh, and so it, uh, it is it's probably, uh, it would be safe to say that it, it's really in, in a risky moment at this point, given the preoccupation of Russia in Ukraine, given the situation in Afghanistan, and everything else that's happening around them. Uh, Lastly, Turkmenistan has a new leader. Uh, his father is still around, so it's probably some form of tag teaming that's going on. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's an, it's also undergoing transformation. It wants to it wants to it wants to uh, you know at least from what we can tell in in the open sources, there is a desire to expand its uh, hydrocarbon export capability, and therefore there is interest being shown in the middle corridor. Uh, but uh, because this is the uh, state of development is perhaps the most primitive in the entire region uh, on a comparative basis, you know there there are risks uh, of how everything plays out within uh, Turkmenistan. So I will stop right there. I think I've tickled everybody's imagination enough, uh, and I'll pass the, the mic back to Wesley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pakari. And I will pass the mic back over to Ms. Lisa Curtis, who uh, will hopefully have a lot to say about uh, the national security aspects of this from the U.S. government point of view and sort of the cutting edge of what was, what was done and what uh, maybe should be done. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Wesley. And thanks to the Wilson Center, Kennan Institute, and International Tax and Investment Center for inviting me here today uh, to speak on this very distinguished panel. Um, uh, I haven't traveled as recently as Ambassador Hoagland to the region, but um, I have been to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan uh, most recently in January of this year uh, in the last 18 months. And of course, visited Central Asia numerous times when I served as Senior Director for South and Central Asia at the National Security Council from 2017 to 2021. So until last year, I think very few people would have questioned Russia's dominant influence in Central Asia. Um, but I think as uh, other panelists have noted, Russia's war against Ukraine has catalyzed a rather significant geopolitical shift uh, in the region and is raising questions about the extent to which the Central Asian nations will allow themselves to remain so heavily reliant on Russia. Uh, before its invasion of Ukraine, Russia had, of course, built uh, substantial security ties with the region, especially through the Collective Security Treaty Organization um, and extensive uh, trade relations through the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, it had provided 80% of arms sales to Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, and, of course, um, troops in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Uh, but there are good reasons for the Central Asian states to increasingly hedge their bets vis-a-vis -vis Russia and focus on expanding relations with other countries, namely China, but also uh, other countries uh, throughout the region. Um, 
And I think, you know, the Central Asian states want to gradually redu reduce their reliance on Moscow, look for alternative sources of trade, investment, and security cooperation. And so far, China has uh, stood to gain the most uh, from this shift. Um, but the United States and Europe also have a substantial opportunity to also enhance their relationships in the region. Um, now, these uh, shifting foreign policy sands that we've all been talking about in Central Asia have been noticeable in Kazakhstan. Uh, when the Kazakh president, Takayev, invited um, the Russian forces into the country following the protests in January 2022, observers had thought it was a sign that his government would prioritize relations with Russia. However, um, you know, that's not exactly what we're seeing play out um, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I think the first hint uh, that of uh, this happening, um, that Kazakhstan would not simply tow the Russian line on Ukraine, was last June um, in St. Petersburg when Takayev stated clearly that Kazakhstan did not recognize quasi-state territories as Russia was uh, seeking to establish in Ukraine. Um, and this signaled Putin that he would not be able to count on unwavering support from its neighbor to the south when it comes to questions of territorial sovereignty. Of course, uh, President Putin expressed his displeasure at Takayev's statement by temporarily halting the transport of Kazakh oil through the Caspian Pipeline Consortium. Um, so Kazakhstan is aware of the cost of being overly dependent on Russia for exporting its oil. Um, and Takayev has remained in touch with Ukrainian President Zelensky. They spoke recently in February um, during a call in which Takayev expressed Kazakhstan's support for a peaceful resolution of the war based on the UN Charter and universally accepted principles of law. So Kazakhstan walks a fine line. Uh, it must both stand up for territorial sovereignty um, because of its, its long border with Russia, uh, but also uh, maintain good relations with Russia for that same reason, because of its very long 4,800 mile long border with Russia. Um, now China has, of course, uh, looked towards Central Asia for trade and transit corridors, for market opportunities. Um, it's come to rely on the route through Kazakhstan to get its goods to Europe. Um, and it's been investing in the energy sector in Central Asia for many, many years. Um, and we heard a lot about the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, from Ambassador Hoagland, some very interesting history on that. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, China is still focused on promoting. And, you know, the point here is some BRI projects are beneficial for the region. Um, we can't deny that. Uh, however, the problems come from the lack of transparency in Chinese lending. Um, Beijing doesn't report official lending, and the risks of its infrastructure loans are often hidden from the recipient of those loans. Um, and the BRI has had a negative impact on the debt profile specifically of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, nearly half of Tajikistan's debt is held by China. Still, China's trade with Central Asia is picking up. In 2022, it topped 70 billion, which was an increase of 40% from the previous year. Um, it's significant that uh, President Xi's first visit uh, outside of China after COVID was to Astana. Uh, so clearly, China is focused on Central Asia, and the Central Asian states are receptive to this increasing Chinese role in the region. Um, so what about U.S. policy? Um, Central Asians uh, are certainly welcoming other countries like the U.S. and Europe to invest and make their presence felt in the region. I think we heard that from Ambassador Ashokbayev this morning. Um, I think the Central Asian nations are concerned about Russian and Chinese hegemonic goals. 
especially with the February 4th, 2022 um, declaration by Russia and China of their No Limits Partnership. And we uh, saw a very productive visit by Secretary of State Blinken to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan in March. Um, he said that the United States would help the countries find balance in their relations with each other, but also um, with the rest of the world at this time of um, great power competition in the region. So the U.S. certainly will not be able to match China dollar for dollar. Uh, it will not be able to supplant Russia's cultural and political influence in the region. Um, but that's not the U.S. goal. Um, the U.S. Uh, goal, I think, is to support the Central Asian nation's independence and sovereignty, um, and that the fact that you have expansionist um, neighbors uh, around Central Asia means that there are uh, many open doors for the United States um, in Central Asia. Um, so when I was senior director at the NSC, uh, we did publish an unclassified version of our Central Asian strategy in 2019. And the emphasis was really on engaging um, in the C5 plus one framework, uh, which of course was started I think in 2015 under the Obama administration. But that was such an important format. Um, so the United States has continued that um, and the idea is that by encouraging regional cooperation among the five Central Asian states and coordination, um, that it becomes a stronger, more resilient region and that it strengthens the individual sovereignty of each of the nations. Um, and, you know, the Biden administration, I believe, has continued the, the Central Asian strategy. I see Eric Green nodding, uh, which is great. I think <laughs> hopefully it had some, some um, lasting um, uh, initiatives there that could be continued. Um, but I think the, the Biden administration's national security strategy also um, highlights uh, the importance of Central Asia um, by talking about the strategic competition with China, the need to work with allies and partners um, in addressing that, but also in noting um, the distinction between Russia and China. On China, of course, the emphasis is on competition, but the national security strategy leaves open the poss possibility for peaceful coexistence with China and makes clear that uh, conflict with China is not inevitable. On Russia, however, uh, the language is sharper, it's more urgent. Uh, the emphasis is on, quote unquote, constraining a profoundly dangerous Russia. Uh, so, you know, obviously the role of Central Asia as we have these tectonic geopolitical shifts um, is, is self-evident. So what should the U.S. do? How should the U.S. move forward? Um, certainly we've heard about the um, the importance of encouraging the development of Caspian energy sources and trans-Caspian energy corridors that link Central Asia, the Caucasus, and Europe. And, you know, it, now is the time for the focus on those um, issues. I know we heard a little bit of pessimism, I think, um, from Kamran, but uh, if ever there was an opportunity to e exploit um, this, uh, this issue and, and to really invest time, effort, and resources, it's, it's now. Um, and in the fall of last year, uh, CNAS, the Center for New American Security, published a report on uh, competitive connectivity, crafting transatlantic responses to China's BRI. And in that report, we made several recommendations for the United States and Europe to address the challenges from the Belt and Road Initiative, such as wargaming China's economic tools of co coercion, uh, examining the security risks in smart infrastructure and green technology, 
um, creating a global consortium to support local journal journalists and research organizations to conduct fact-based inquiries into BRI projects so that we don't see the same kind of uh, problems that we've seen in Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Um, and establishing a rapid response fund to prevent uh, China from exploiting weakened economies um, and getting them uh, further into debt traps. Um, so the U.S. Uh, can also do more to support intra-regional cooperation. We've heard a lot about that. And then lastly, on the counterterrorism issue. Um, I think this is most important when it comes to Tajikistan because of its long border with Afghanistan. Um, the U.S. Uh, can increase its um, support for border security um, and, and, you know, enhance uh, security um, along that, that uh, border where we see uh, ISIS elements um, and a host of other terrorist organizations um, increasing in strength. Um, and I think the Tajikistan government does deserve credit for allowing the National Resistance Front to have its base there, um, allowing the Afghan ambassador of the Islamic Republic to continue um, to speak out and, and hold meetings. Um, and it occurs to me that President Rahman has a certain clarity about the Taliban that, uh, frankly, I think the rest of the region uh, perhaps lacks um, and it, it's probably because of his own experience in uh, dealing with Islamic radicalism in Tajikistan. Um, lastly, the U.S. should support reforms in the region, political reforms uh, in Kazakhstan in particular, expanding public participation in the political process, curbing corruption, protecting human rights, um, and I will raise that I am concerned about the way the case has been handled uh, in convicting Karim Masimov, the former head of the National Security Committee. I am concerned about whether he was scapegoated for the events in January 2022. Um, so, you know, we need to continue to support political reforms, strong judicial systems, um, ensure that the due process of law is always uh, closely followed in these countries. So there is an opportunity for greater American and European influence in Central Asia, but only if our countries come to the table with more high-level attention, investment, and assistance. Um, I think the U.S. needs to demonstrate that we are reliable partners um, and that we acknowledge, you know, economic issues like inflation, unemployment, uh, the need for new export routes um, are at the top of mind of our Central Asian partners. So let me just stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We're now going to turn to the question and answer section of this panel. For our online audience, you can submit your questions for, uh, via email at Kennan, uh, or excuse me, Twitter, if you type uh, at Kennan Institute, and online, Kennan at uh, wilsoncenter.org. For our first question, this was a question directed at the entire panel, so whoever wants to uh, take it can grab it. What is the state of Sino-Russian competition or cooperation currently in Central Asia? I, I think that if you look at it from it depends who you're talking about. From from the Chinese point of view, um, they they thought that the war in Ukraine would go in favor of the Russians. It hasn't, so they've had to sort of course correct, uh, and 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 they've been doing that all along the way. So they don't they don't want this war to affect how they do business. So if it turned out that you know the West was uh, on the receiving end of this war, then you know there is benefit from that that the Chinese can take advantage of. That's not happening. So now what they're trying to do is say, okay, you know, let's keep, let's wrap this up. Let's not, at least, not make it worse. And and I think that's sort of the cooperation that's happening. Uh, do the Chinese want to provide weapons to uh, Russia, 
or any other form of material support that can help them, you know, make, uh, make it, uh, a shift in the battle space. I have my doubts about that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, there's also this long-term thing that a Russia that's weakening opens up possibilities, something I mentioned in my, in my presentation, for the Chinese in Central Asia and, and other places. Uh, so for, I, I, I am hesitant to use the word cooperation. I think it's, it is opportunistic what the Chinese are doing, uh, and we just need to see it from that lens. Thank you very much. And if we have uh, any questions from our in-house audience, it would be great. Um, I'm Alan Mustard. I was ambassador to Turkmenistan for uh, a while, uh, a few years ago. But uh, before that, I was an agricultural officer with USDA and spent the uh, uh, bulk of my career overseas. So I'm always happy uh, to hear someone talk about agriculture. And uh, I wanted to pose a question to Ambassador Abu Sa'id of uh, the agricultural potential of Central Asia, and in particular, a, a country like Kazakhstan is constrained by water availability. And what I see is uh, climate change reducing the water that's going to be available between now and about 2050. If you look at the Asian Development Bank, uh, studies of climate risk, uh, they basically say after 2050, water availability in Central Asia is going to go over a cliff. What is Kazakhstan doing to prepare for this and be given agriculture as an important part of the Kazakh economy? Uh, what are the plans for dealing with reduced water availability due to climate change? I'm very sorry to cut in an answer for him, but unfortunately, Ambassador Abu Saitov is having some technical difficulties. So uh, we, we have that question recorded, and hopefully when he's reconnected, he will be able to answer that question. Uh, in the meantime, uh, more in-house questions, please. Yes, here. Uh, Ariel Cohen, uh, the Atlantic Council and ITIC. Uh, just to follow up on what Kamran said, uh, to me, uh, the Russia-China uh, dynamic is absolutely unique because whichever way the war in Ukraine goes, China wins. If Russia is successful in Ukraine, well, it's not successful, but if it, in the end it sort of punches through. Uh, China and Russia together um, can put pressure on Europe and engage the United States in Europe, uh, tying up our attention and resources there. Uh, if Russia were successful, it would be um, a battering ram against the US interests in the Euro-Atlantic So, But if Russia loses, like a satellite that is running out of momentum, it would be falling into the gravitational pool of China, uh, Russian resources would become available and cheap for the Chinese purchase because now we are not interested in buying their resources. And geopolitically, Russia would be taking orders from Beijing. So like uh, in, ch in the chess, where you have a fork, a tsukzwang, uh, whatever way Russia goes, China wins. And it's a unique and fascinating geopolitical situation. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Perus. Sebastian Perus, I'm the director of the Central Asia Private George Washington University. So, I mean, one of the points today uh, is also to talk about uh, the multi-vector uh, policies that Central Asian countries can use in, to balance the influence of China and Russia. And Ambassador Sheikhbayev actually talked about uh, the importance of more distant actors. What about the role of uh, Turkey, which has launched, I mean, a significant uh, uh, soft power policy in Central Asia, and especially uh, since the beginning of the war in Ukraine? 
And uh, actually, my question is maybe less on Turkey by itself than uh, on the organization of the Turkic states, uh, which, uh, which Turkey is using to really increase uh, its influence in the region. And this organization has huge plans, I mean, in all sectors, in, uh, in the military sector, in economy, in social sectors, in cultural sectors. On the other hand, uh, it has a very limited funds. I mean, it has a funds of, if I'm not mistaken, between 350 and 500 million dollars, which is very low if we put that in, perspect into, uh, in perspective with uh, the huge plans that this organization states it will implement. And also, if we put that in perspective with what China has been able and will be able to, to invest. So how would you assess that? I'd like to start the answer to that, Sebastian, and thank you for that really good question. I'm sure that since we have experts around the table here, you all know that um, immediately after the independence of these states, Turkey jumped in in a really big way, but it jumped in in a way that really wasn't appropriate. Uh, to the extent that some people said, I'm quoting here, that um, it was as if they were trying to teach the little brown brothers. Um, and so Turkey pulled back for uh, at least a decade and longer. It's only now with the, or the emergence of a new form of the organization of Turkic states that Turkey is playing an increasingly interesting and in some ways appropriate role throughout the region. Uh, in my recent travels through the region, I have heard from both government and private sector high-level people that they do appreciate what the OTS is trying to accomplish at this time. But they do point out that it leaves out Tajikistan because Tajikistan is not a Turkic state. It's a former Persian outpost of the Persian Empire. Uh, so the OTS has a significant role to play. There's one more thing that I would point out that uh, you can link to OTS in Central Asia, and that's the value of Transcaspian uh, influences. What I'm finding is that Azerbaijan is increasingly paying attention to Central Asia and Central Asia to Azerbaijan. Uh, it's very, very important for those, both sides of the Caspian to work together. And um, I know that it's probably not right yet at the point where it can happen, but with the US C5 plus one in Central Asia, it would be of real use given the current geopolitical situation to at least involve Azerbaijan as an observer state in the C5 plus one. And ultimately then I would say it would be better to put Azerbaijan in as a member because that will help further the US support for the middle corridor and it will also build uh, the, the support that the countries in the region feel from the United States, that we don't separate them geologic, geographically. Um, I, I think God separates it geologically. <laughs> but in any case, um, that's what I'd like to say. I think Turkey, the bottom line, is playing an increasingly positive role, but it has to be careful that it doesn't come across as trying to reestablish the Ottoman Empire. Thank you. I'd just like to add a couple of things to what Ambassador Hoagland eloquently put. Uh, Turkey has an, an intent to play a major role in Central Asia, no doubt about it. The issue is one of capability. And at this point in time, um, it, it, it is in a financial crunch. It is going through political transformation. This stuff has to be sorted out. The internal stuff has to be sorted out before Turkey can really project uh, influence in Central Asia. They have that piece of the puzzle, the, the springboard, if you will, in the South Caucasus in place, 
which is why they supplied the Bayraktar to the Azerbaijanis in 2020 and other forms of military and intelligence support um, because they want to be able to use, be that critical link between Caucasus Central Asian energy and the European market. Uh, but they will require uh, a lot of shakedown time and to deal with the immediate issues. Uh, but yes, the, un the Union of Turkish, uh, or the Organization of Turkic States uh, is also part of that architecture. Interestingly, uh, you know, Hungary is part of this architecture mm -hmm. in a strange way. You would think Mr. Orban would be uh, more closer to the Kremlin, but I think he's hedging his bets as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we actually have several questions from the audience, all revolving around Afghanistan. So several audience members have noted online uh, how strange it is from their perspective that Afghanistan has not come up more, especially since for a very long time Afghanistan was sort of the focal point of American policy in the region. So how has the withdrawal from Afghanistan impacted U.S. policy towards Central Asia, and will there be a dark specter hanging over American policy in the region? Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I mentioned Afghanistan, but certainly we haven't sort of given it its due um, in our discussion yet. Well, first, when it comes to the China-Russia question, uh, you know, we've always seen in the past Russia more invested in Central Asia and security issues, China more on the economic front. But I think there's a real possibility of China feeling compelled to get more involved in Central Asia uh, on security grounds in terms of um, assistance, you know, border help on the border. We're already seeing that in Tajikistan. Um, and this could actually lead to more tensions between Russia and China. But because uh, of what we're seeing in Afghanistan, the you know, rebuilding of, of terrorist uh, groups, uh, particularly ISIS-K, which has conducted several attacks um, and and is, um, you know, very powerful, strong um, uh, bases in northern Afghanistan, uh, threatening uh, Central Asia and also uh, in in China. So I think you know that is a, is going to be more of an issue moving forward. China is going to feel compelled to uh, help the Central Asians protect their own borders uh, from terrorists coming out of Afghanistan. And that will, in turn, lead to more tension with Russia um, because of that increased security footprint. Um, and just, again, I would uh, point out that um, of all the Central Asian nations, I think the Tajik leadership has been most clear-eyed about what the Taliban is and the dangers that they pose to the region. Um, I think there's been a lot of wishful thinking, um, not only in Central Asia and other parts of the world as well, about the Taliban and thinking of the Taliban as uh, a counterterrorism partner um, because they also oppose ISIS-K. But I would just caution there. Um, because even though uh, ISIS-K is an enemy of the Taliban, um, that doesn't make the Taliban a counterterrorism partner of the United States or any other country. Um, they are uh, rebuilding madrasas. They're continuing to inculcate um, young people with their radical ideology. Um, the Taliban continues to be allied with al-Qaeda, uh, which could also rebuild um, in, in the coming months and years. And, you know, the way they are treating women will have an impact on terrorism extremist trends in the country. So, again, I think that um, the Central Asian nations would do well to be uh, very skeptical of Taliban leadership and to think about, you know, how they're going to deal with this um, uh, extremist group that is now in charge of Afghanistan. Thank you very much. We are approaching the end of our time for this first panel, but we have time for one more brief question. So. Yeah, hi, Gavin Hell from uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. So one of the problems of, of um, 
talking about great power competition is, is um, Ambassador Ashik Bayev said, turn Central Asia into a, a chessboard. I'd like to turn that around and, and ask, where is the Cholpanata process, the process we were all very excited about a year ago uh, of the Central Asian states holding together as five um, uh, and, and taking on some agency, if we get a, uh, an idea of where that's going and where that's uh, moving. I can say just a, a very brief word about that, but I really, really hope that one of our Central Asian guests will speak to this. Um, this is a, a long, slow movement. Um, the Central Asians began to meet as C5 without a plus one or whatever, um, oh, at least six years ago. And at the beginning, they began to study, they set up a, a small group to study other examples of how this has been done in the past. And they looked at ASEAN, for example. They looked at the Nordic Council. And it looked like there were, things were going to move forward fairly smoothly, but we all know in real life things never move forward from point A to point B fairly smoothly. Uh, and so uh, there was, a change of government, for example, in Uzbekistan that uh, needed to be taken into account, new president in Kazakhstan that needed to be taken into account. Of the five states, they weren't all equally interested in this, although all five were participating. But I do think, my own personal opinion, but having had experience in the region for oh, t at least 25 years now and somewhat longer, um, I do really think that the future of the region is moving toward not some sort of block which would make them lose their political independence, but some sort of organization which will make them stronger economically in the region, and ultimately that is to the every state's benefit in the region. So that's just a little bit of my meandering about this. I think that's the ultimate goal, and I think that's where it'll go. But it's a slow process, and they're not there yet. I'd love to hear from others, so please. If I, may, I, may I answer? I, I am, I'm, I'm sorry to... I am forgot to... Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, for Katsadek, new ambassador of Uzbekistan. First of all, I would like to congratulate the ambassador of Kazakhstan and the Kenya institution for this very important, very interesting uh, conference. I enjoyed it very well. Uh, just about the cooperation with Central Asia, it's very interesting, and I would like to say thank you. We will resume. <laughs> uh, you know, I just came to Washington one month back. I was first deputy minister of foreign minister of Uzbekistan, and I was responsible for economic diplomacy. And I would like to tell you that. As you know that uh, now we can, as you know that the first priority of the president of Uzbekistan is Central Asia. Because of the will of the two leaders of Central Asia, first of all, the wills, political wills of the president of Kazakhstan, president of Uzbekistan, and other leaders, now we can speak about the voice of Central Asia. Uh, we are having very good cooperation with our neighbors. Every leaders, we're having annually, every year they're having the meetings in different capitals. And I can tell you that uh, for, uh, for Uzbekistan, Central Asia has priority. And uh, now even the, we, Kazakhstan, our very trusted, reliable partner, we signed when President Tokai paid visit to Uzbekistan last year in, the, in December, I think so. We signed strategic partnership agreement. What we're doing now that uh, we're calling this complementary economy. Uh, we are exchange the list of products between two countries, and uh, we buy, now we're importing some goods which we used to import from other countries, and the Kazakhstan do, doing the same. We have a good cooperation in our agriculture center. We're having very well understanding on regional issues. We're totally supporting regional and foreign policy of Kazakhstan, and uh, we are having very good consultation on re regional issues. And I think that uh, Central Asia could be one of the let's say, new 
business or let's say trade hub for for in the world because Central Asia could be a bridge which can connect Central Asia and South Asia. I used to be the Uzbek ambassador in Pakistan. Uh, I think that South Asia market is very important for us. It's a big market. We would like to be there. So, and I think that uh, right now, good thing that this, you know, in the beginning, this is cooperation between Central Asian countries was initiated by the presidents of Central Asia. But now we're feeling that is now nation of Central Asia supporting each other. I can tell you that trade turnover of Uzbekistan with our neighbor countries last five years increased more than seven times. Touristic flow to Uzbekistan from neighboring countries increased more than five times. Right now, I told you about the Kazakhstan. We are very appreciated the support of Kazakhstan, the Uzbekistan reforms and the cooperation with Uzbekistan. For example, right now with Kazakhstan, we have at least five flights per day to different cities and more than 25 bus races and very well working routes. And now no visa regime with all Central Asian countries. So I think that it's success of Central Asian leaderships, uh, success of the Central Asian leaders, in, uh, and I think that we have a lot of unlocked potential for enhance our cooperation. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Well, I can't think of a better way to end our first panel for today. So uh, book ended by uh, ambassadors. So we will have a brief intermission, so please grab some coffee or tea, whatever, and we will reconvene in six minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today to this conference. We have an outstanding lineup of speakers. Uh, I want particularly to recognize ambassadors of Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan for participating. Um, this is a meaty, substantive conference. I also want to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Wes Hill and uh, Shalom Oscar David for working extra time. I also want to thank our colleagues at um, the Kennan Institute and particularly William Pomerantz and his staff for being terrific colleagues. Will, I just mentioned you. Thank you so much for collaborating. Uh, and with that, we spoke about the strategic outlook uh, in Central Asia. Our panel will focus on geoeconomics, uh, on the economic development potential, and uh, on what the U.S. policy can and should be uh, to this strategic region. Before starting the panel, I asked uh, how the computer, no, uh, Chad GPT, um, which country Central Asia uh, can be compared uh, to if it were one country. And uh, the Supreme Intelligence said, uh, Thailand, 69.8 million and 500 billion dollars uh, GDP. Central Asia combined 72 million uh, and 300 billion um, G, uh, combined GDP for Central Asia. However, with PPP and PPP uh, purchasing uh, parity uh, is a more controversial measure. It's a trillion dollars because some of the, you, you traveled in the region, some of the um, prices uh, in the region are much cheaper. Uh, than uh, in the West. So another country uh, Central Asia can be combined is South Africa, 59.6 uh, million population with 300 uh, billion uh, GDP, and Vietnam, 100 million population, 341 billion um, GDP. So we see that if you look at the region in combination, uh, you see a significant mid-sized economic player on the global scale. Uh, and uh, I would ask now Professor Frederick Starr, uh, the model for emulation for all of us, uh, that's a Persian term, by the way, 
the uh, Hojat al-Islam that uh, everybody follows. Um, Fred, uh, kick it off, give us the view um, of the region from the geoeconomic perspective, and then um, Fred will be followed by Marsha McGraw-Olive, uh, Jennifer Meal, and um, Eric will draw the conclusions and wrap it up for us. Uh, we uh, will finish by about 1 o'clock, 1.10, and we're expecting Assistant Secretary Jeff uh, Piat to give closing remarks. Fred? Thank you. I'm going to be speaking not... I'm going to be speaking not just geopolitically, geoeconomically, but from the geo-geographical perspective. Uh, now, let me say right off the bat, this is the right focus on Russia and China. It, it, it's timely. It's the right, right focus, uh, not least because whatever is happening in Ukraine, Russia at this point is the key biggest economic and security partner of every country in Central Asia, whether you like it or not. That's reality. Um, th th there are others, uh, but that, that is the context. Now, let me, let me say that that context is made complicated, obviously, by, by events taking place, uh, the threats against northern Kazakhstan, of course. Um, all of the countries we're speaking about still follow what is now President Takayev's 1997 book. It's a big, fat book uh, in which he presented the idea of, of a balanced foreign policy. And it was very simple. He said, having a certain Chinese background as a dip diplomat, he said, let's balance Russia with China. And then two years later, two and a half, three years later, he published an article in which he said, well, we have to supplement this concept by balancing Russia and China with the West. And, and that's basically where now every country in the region is, is pursuing this line uh, quite rationally and quite reasonably. Um, now, how does this work for the US? Very simply, during the Afghan years, the US ignored Central Asia. You can, you can put fancier words on it. Yes, we did this, we did this, we did this. Everything was subordinated to Afghanistan. And now, since, nine, since the departure from, since Mr. Biden's untimely and unplanned departure from Afghanistan, uh, we have continued to ignore them, even though we can, all, we can, we can cite all sorts of actions and pl pluses. Uh, what we usually hear about is the most recent meeting of the C5 plus one. Now, our institute has conducted over uh, the past year a whole series, dozens and dozens and dozens of interviews with officials across Central Asia in every country and un not officials, just experts and ordinary people, business people. Uh, in, in every country, and we've combined these in a long paper, which is, I think, published now or just soon will be, which is U.S. Policy Through Central Asian Eyes. Uh, and I'm not going into that paper, but it, uh, let me just cite one obvious point with regard to C5 plus 1. Namely, it's very hard to find among serious observers in the region people who, once they're stripped of, of, of diplomatic uh, politeness uh, will say anything very positive about C5 plus one. Remember, it wasn't our invention. It was proposed by Kazakh, the uh, Kazakh ambassador in Washington, and it was approved by Mr. Kerry because it was easier to get it off his, this was a way of getting the whole region off his back. Um, but the, the reports from the, from the uh, uh, participants are not very encouraging. They say n n poor planning, poor staffing, lower level people attending, and especially pointing out that, that, our, that it is not a place to discuss security, which is high on their agenda, as it must be. 
Why? Because security is done through NATO in Brussels, uh, or it's done through, through, through the, the Pentagon. Uh, yes, there's a Pentagon representative at the most recent meeting in, 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 in Astana, but the reality is that the C5 plus 1 does not t address the most important issue facing each of these countries, and that's security. And, and there's no structure for America doing that at the present. Um, now, there are things that C5 plus 1 could be doing that it's not doing. Why? What, what one could imagine, for example, uh, uh, creating region-wide media, multilingual, including English, media that extend across the entire region. This would be simple, easy, and cheap, and we have the skills to do it. Everyone would appreciate it. Nothing done on this. Another thing uh, along the same lines would be region-wide freight. We heard reference to the increased flights in the region. That's well and good, but there's no freight uh, transport in the region that's really effective or used. This could be created. I talked with the Boeing people in Seattle about this a few weeks ago. This could be done overnight. And we have the skills and the people, and it's not cost. It's initiative that's missing. OK, now, um, the. Um, the problem is, beyond that, that the U.S. has largely ignored Central Asia. I, uh, the, the new president, Berdy Mohamedov of Turkmenistan, has met three times with Xi Jinping. Uh, I don't believe he's met with President Biden, uh, let alone has President Biden visited twice. Um, this is extreme, but it, it, it's representative of the situation. Uh, it's complicated, of course, by the fact that there are huge debts, as has been mentioned here, uh, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan particularly. But the fact is, the uh, uh, U.S. has been largely um, uh, absent. Um, we are now faced with this war in Ukraine. And it's striking that... <laughs> <laughs> Only one or person here has been really spoken directly about it and what are its outcomes. We're like driving with our eyes on the rearview mirror. We're not looking ahead. We're not looking ahead in this discussion. What are the possible outcomes and what do they mean for this region? Well, one is very simple. Russia, uh, as uh, Ariel Cohen said, Russia doesn't necessarily win, but it comes away with something. Well, it still loses, it, 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 as he pointed out, and I, I agree with that, because they'll, they'll the next day face guerrilla war and demands for money to rebuild, not to mention uh, 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 um, having international strictures. If they, if they lose, uh, there may be interim hardliners in, 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 in charge in Moscow. Uh, they, they won't be any more successful, uh, whether it's uh, the Prigozhinites or the Girkinites or someone like that. They won't be more, any more successful than the present crowd from the ministry. And uh, then the one can, must consider, I'm not saying project, but one must consider soberly the possibility of, in, uh, of collapse of a new government possibly one which will have to make deals with the powerful regional governors, of whom there are several very good ones, uh, and have more decentralization and self-government, which has huge meaning for Central Asia. Or uh, uh, um, uh, it might even involve some unwinding, specifically Chechnya. Che Chechnya's government in exile, Zakhaev, uh, 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 I met Zakhaev, he, he's a very bright guy. I've known him for 30 years. He, he's, he, he's thoroughly modern and Western in his outlook. Um, uh, what if, what if, a, uh, if an independent government emerges in Chechnya? How does that cha change everything? Well, it does. And I'm not saying this is going to happen or that's going to happen, but any serious planning has to include such considerations. Now, with that brings us to the middle corridor. 
Very good project. I'm 100% with everyone here who's spoken in its favor. And I'm uh, with the Central Asians. I wrote, wrote a long thing about the uh, uh, possible harmonization of American and Chinese interests on that project. However, there, there are two very obvious points that need to be, need to be mentioned. Uh, first of all, uh, this depends on the caucuses. And uh, you, you can't go over them. OK, Azerbaijan is talking. And I heartily agree with the suggestion that Azerbaijan uh, be added to C5 plus 1. I, I, and do that immediately. Don't, don't wait. Uh, but you can't go over Georgia. If you, can't, if you don't have fully the same understandings with Georgia, this won't work. Therefore, and that's uh, with Mr. Ivanishvili, that is by no means a, a, a given. And so that has to be addressed. And beyond that, there has been an assumption here, which Ambassador Mustard will, uh, could speak to much better than I can, about, about the uh, uh, state of Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is not about to cooperate on Trans-Caspian things, not because they're against it, but, but, but that we have given them over the last 30 years practically no reason for them to have confidence in dealing with the US. Uh, it, uh, I, I won't bother you with examples, but they, they have big projects that they've undertaken with other countries, but not with any American firm. Uh, some of you <laughs> are battle scar scarred on this subject, Steve, my friend Steve Mann uh, above all. But, but the fact is, they don't have this experience. Had they had this experience, we'd have something to build on we don't right now. So this, this is not a, a, a slam dunk, this, this, this east-west corridor. But now let me stress again that geography is key for everyone. It's not geopolitics or geoeconomic, it's geography per se. And if you pull back, look at this region as a region with the Caucasus, their, their distinctive quality is their geographical isolation, landlocked. Trade moves mainly by ship today. And that's not good news if you're in Central Asia. So they have openings to the east now by rail. They have always had ro openings to the, the north. We're discussing openings to the west. That isn't enough. The key issue is still, as it's always been, opening a window to the south. This means not just to through to India, huge and emerging economy there, but also uh, once you're down to the Arabian Sea, to the Middle East, and above all to Southeast Asia, all of Southeast Asia. Every country in Central Asia desperately needs this. Without this window, they're, they're living in a, in a room with too low a ceiling. They can't stand up. And, and we have never embraced this cause. This, this is high on the priorities of every country, but we have never embraced it. General Petraeus came close. Uh, he persuaded Hillary Clinton to, to give her speech in Chennai, but, but that w produced never a word of support for that concept uh, from the White House, and even that concept, as she put it forward, was flawed. But we have never embraced this. We had, we had a generation in Afghanistan to do so. We never did. We reorganized the State Department to make it Central and South Asia on the assumption that, that something would happen in terms of a linkage, but we never built the linkage. Uh, so, so here's where we are. We could still take this up. Now, let me just m m mention that the Central Asians, in our absence, are doing so. And, and I, let me start by saying that the, every country has its own initiatives, without any exception, and Azerbaijan. And, and what does this mean? For example, Turkmenistan, I know this still seems like a, 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 a long shot, but it is actively pursuing the TAPI project. It is act, actively pursuing financing, mainly in the Middle East today. It is actively pursuing a railroad into Afghanistan and selling electricity into Afghanistan. Uh, 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 Kazakhstan, same. All, all, 
very active uh, uh, quietly on several fronts. Um, Uzbekistan has been notably so. Uh, they have very competent people, very knowledgeable, and very well known in Afghanistan who are there all the time. Uh, and they are, they are actively pursuing the railroad, tra the transportation project. They are actively pursuing big water project with the, with the Afghans across, around Balkh. All sorts of things going on. Now, none of these countries are, have recognized the Taliban government. So we can calm down on this. Yes, they're, they're having, exchanging charge d'affaires, but these people, uh, these people are not formal diplomats. They are being treated as such. It's a nice game. But how should we be dealing with this in the West? How should America, the EU, be, be treating this development? I think we should be welcoming it. Why? Because they're, not, they're, they're cautious uh, on, on recognition, as is everyone else, by the way. Um, however, they are eyes and ears in Afghanistan today. They are directly engaged, they are a way for other countries, including the US and Europe, to, to perceive di the d direction of developments there and take advantage of change if and when they occur. So I think that's a, a useful thing where we could be collaborating. We absolutely not because the US has not a word to say on Afghanistan except keep out since, since our, we left. Now, uh, uh, let me just say about regional cooperation. Uh, our uh, ambassador from Uzbekistan understated the situation. There's a lot that has been going on. They're, they are, meet, for example, on Afghanistan, they're totally coordinated. They're in touch on this at the top level. The presidents do meet regularly. And in terms of the uh, uh, Chopin Atta, uh, uh, 20, I mean, 36 different areas of cooperation that they all signed up on uh, 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 in, 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 in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, they're, they're actively, actively pursuing quite a number of these. We are doing an inventory of what, they, what is going on in each of these areas. We are presenting this at the Kamka conference in Astana. You're all welcome to come in July it's going to be, or June. It's going to be very interesting. But it's going to have full report from each country on what they're actually doing. But there's more happening as a group. And that's why RC5 plus one is all the more d disappointing. And let me say, if, there, if we don't pursue this more actively, the Chinese are doing exactly what they should be doing. They are creating their own C5 plus one. But ours, which, which has never had a presidential visit, uh, the Chinese one is being planned at the presidential level at a meeting in China to be followed by their first meeting at the presidential level within Central Asia itself in the next couple of months. So to say, that, I mean, hats off to the Chinese. They're doing what any uh, awake uh, diplomats would do. They are taking advantage uh, of, of, of the situation. Now, um, final point. We, we have framed Central Asia as, as sort of this curious region uh, between big powers. It, it, it's neither here nor there. It has relations here and there and so on. Complicated place and a, a deep but vexed history and so on. We, we've never really got it, in, got it right. The reality is that if Central Asia, including Afghanistan, do not evolve as open societies, as modern societies, as societies based on principles that we hold dear, if they do not, then you will have stretching from the Chinese East China Sea all the way to the Middle East and to, to, to Europe, you will have a single unbroken block, block of authoritarian states. Easy transport among them, easy trans trade among them. If you're not acknowledging this prospect, you're not dealing with reality. And, and we do not talk about strategy. 
Sorry, Stra strategy as, as so many of our Central Asian interlocutors when we were doing all these interviews said is, your strategy is blah, blah, blah. That's a, a, a technical term, as you know. Uh, uh, the, it, it, the question is, what do you actually do? And, and what we need is a, con we need at the conceptual level, a clearer understanding that this is a zone that could be a, 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 a play a, a very active and central role, not against anyone, but for some of the values that we champion. And as open economies, open, open political systems, we, that, could, that would be important. And the price of not having that is going, would be enormous. And we never calculate that when we're discussing where does this fit into the big picture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. A lot of food for thought, and I think a great 60,000 feet view. Now let's drill down to the geoeconomic uh, aspects of the region and of the US uh, relationship with um, the region C plus, uh, C5 plus one criticism taking under consideration. Uh, so, Marsha, why don't you uh, take a lead here and we'll... I'm happy to do the drilling, uh, not in the dentist chair, though. Um, I first went to Central Asia 30 years ago on the first World Bank mission to the region, and our plane landed right after the one that carried James Baker, Secretary of State James Baker. My recent visit to Central Asia came right on the heels of Secretary of State Blinken. And each visit represented new beginnings. This time, as the previous one, where all the officials were speaking with one voice. And I have to say, I was writing that thought to myself of speaking with one voice before I heard the ambassador from us, Becky San, say that, which felt good to hear. So this time, what did they say? And I'm going to quote one senior official. This is from Kazakhstan. Quote, the necessity to diversify is the bottom line lesson of the current war in Ukraine. And it will remain so. You don't go back to the past. So implementing that vision will bring significant benefits to Central Asia states and to their neighbors in the Caucasus. But the question is how to make the benefits sustainable for local people improving their lives without replacing dependency on one regional hegemon for another. So let me repeat, how to make these benefits of diversification sustainable for local people to improve their lives without replacing a dependency on Russia for a dependency on China. Uh, I have four main points, and each of them is a bit contrarian. The first actually mimics something we just heard for, from um, my very dear mentor, Dr. Starr, um, that first strong interdependencies do remain with Russia and they are growing with China. Number two, for as much as we talk about the middle corridor, the northern corridor through Russia to Europe is down but not out. Third, whatever the war's outcome, the two big winners from a geoeconomic standpoint, will be Kazakhstan and China. And third, this poses a challenge for US policy towards China. Because how do you help your, your, your friends in Central Asia if you have to cooperate with an increasingly aggressive and highly strategic competitor? And do you do that? And my recommendation is the United States should. And I have caveats for that because how we do it has to bring in more players to the region and improve the lives of Central Asian people in the process. So those are my four key points. Let me go to each one. First is that the strong interdependencies with Russia cannot just be waved away. 
The region depends on Russian imports for value chains as imports to their exports in several fields, such as metals, agriculture, chemicals, and machinery, and this is particularly the case for Uzbekistan. Kazakhstan is the most important dependent market on imports from Russia after Belarus. And Kazakhstan also shares ownership rights and rolling stock with Russia and Belarus in the Eurasian Rail Alliance, and that goes through the Northern Corridor. And until the war, that um, uh, institutional and infrastructure arrangement made this Northern Corridor the most reliable and straightforward and fast east-west trail route, and I'll talk more about that later. Now, there's a growing business line that isn't talked about too much, but that is parallel imports to Russia. Um, Commerçant recently said that that was valued at about $20 billion since the war started. I don't know if that's true, um, but it noted that there could be constraints on that because there's so much demand coming through Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and Belarus. Now, the, that's the reliance that we currently have, with, that the region has with Russia, economically, geoeconomically. But to look at China, uh, trade boomed in 2022. Uh, the region, it happens to be easy to remember, trade grew by 32%, which totaled $32 billion. So if you need to remember the numbers. But the trade record was really hit with Kazakhstan last year. It went to $24 billion, partially driven by this, these, these parallel imports, um, but also because of huge growth in agricultural uh, demand from ag for agricultural products and on many others from China. And this trade is driving new, uh, in new investments in logistics and in rail links that will eventually fall under the BRI umbrella. And there are many, many examples of this that I could go into. But now I think the key point here is that there are limits to the degree of decoupling that one can expect from Russia in the near term. And at the same time, uh, this dependency on China will grow in the absence of investment from other partners. And this is why it's very important to see that the EU and Turkey and other countries are increasing their agreements for strategic investments in the region. And you compare that with the United States, this $50 million in the um, ERASEN, the Economic Resilience in Central Asia Program, um, whatever its merits may be, it is seen as a poor substitute for the very serious uh, foreign direct investment that is coming from uh, China and Russia. So now my second point, that the Northern Corridor shows surprising resilience, um, and it's down but not out. Uh, two key points. One is that, you, as you may know, that this northern corridor hit, uh, it's been, it was been on a track to double in volume every couple of years, and it hit 1.5 or so million 20-foot uh, container equivalents. And this is just a measure of how many block trains with large containers have moved east-west. But it, in 2022, because of the Ukraine war, that dropped by about 30 percent. And aside from the drop during 2022, I was surprised when we were in Central Asia recently to be told that, oh no, but the Northern Corridor is bouncing back. And that took me by surprise. So I went back and I looked, and it turns out that a couple things were happening. One was that it's been like a roller coaster. And at one point during the summer last year, the level of trade reached what it had been in its high year of 2021. Uh, and then the beginning of this year, it's rebounded again. So it's back up to the higher levels of the past. But in the meantime, what happened was there's a geographic concentration where those goods went. They were primarily going now into Poland and into Budapest. Why? Because there's a large Chinese footprint in, in Hungary and into Liège in, in Belgium because it's the Alibaba's hub for e-commerce. So you're seeing demand east-west, and this is probably going to keep going despite the geopolitical challenges of that route because of the recovery now in China. So we have to remember that is a reality and to go back to the geoeconomic realities. Um, uh, but as I still would like to say, despite that, and despite this traffic through Russia, 
I think it's safe to predict that the winners are going to be Kazakhstan and China from the shifts that have happened because of the war. The, the main shifts that are happening is that demand that had come from Russia are now shifting to other countries for products, and that's changing trade routes. So why Kazakhstan among others in Central Asia? Well, before the war, and I know Ambassador Ashik Bayev knows this, that I wrote that I thought that Uzbekistan was in the driver's seat from the standpoint of regional connectivity because it has the largest population and it's the most diversified economy. And I think it's still going to be very dynamic because of the privatization process that's going on, the investments coming from China, and also they, they've got some new trade links coming in both from uh, Kazakhstan, from China, and potentially from Kyrgyz, through the Kyrgyz Republic. But I think on balance, when you take a look at what's happening because of the Ukraine war and the en energy transition, and the energy transition is a big factor, that all the ups, economically point to food, renewables, and geography as the big factors that are going to work in Kazakhstan's favor. Um, this last year, there have been huge increases, twofold with Turkey, Turkia, fivefold to Azerbaijan and, um, and Italy of bilateral trade in wheat. Kazakhstan has got enormous agricultural potential. In addition, um, we have seen huge growth in investments in renewables from the Europeans in uh, central, uh, in, in Kazakhstan, and including from China, a big wind power station. And um, I think we can also say that Kazakhstan is going to reap the benefits of the renewables in, uh, in terms of electronic vehicles, be electric vehicles, because of mining, because the whole transition Energy transition requires minerals, and this boom in, in agreements is going to benefit um, uh, Kazakhstan. Now, the geographic position, I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, I mentioned the northern corridor, and already there are two. But what happens is the rail goes through um, China. It enters Kazakhstan, and it goes back up north through Russia. And there are only already two rail crossings, and China and Kazakhstan just agreed on a third one. So that northern corridor is going to continue to be a route important to, to uh, Kazakhstan. The middle corridor, which goes through the Caspian, um, uh, I have to say that if you look at just 2022, Kazakhstan has signed five critical agreements with its neighbors, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey, five key agreements to make that corridor uh, work. Um, the Baku Agreement was about customs. The uh, Eurasian Rail Alliance with Georgia and Azerbaijan was about coordinating in the same way that coordination is done through the Northern Corridor, which is one great advantage it has. The EU has signed new agreements that will cause demand to come. You need to have trade for these routes to be economic, and that driver could be coming more from Europe and their bilateral agreements. So all of these will put Kazakhstan in a very good position. But I, I do want to put a little bit of realism in this, that even under the best case scenario, you're not going to be able to replace the Northern Corridor. But there is another really wonderful thing about this corridor. It is a vision towards regional economic hubs. And this is something I heard when I was in Central Asia. You don't have to just think about one big block of Central Asia. You have to think about Central Asia and the Caucasus through this region creating regional hubs that will provide a much bigger uh, perspective and vision for all of the people in the area. And after, after the earthquakes in Turkey, uh, Turkey and uh, recovery in Ukraine, I'm, there will be a lot of growth going uh, that direction. So I'm going, I've got one minute, so I'm going to mention the North-South Corridor because Kazakhstan is again well positioned on the North-South South Corridor because it just signed an agreement with Russia and Turkmenistan to continue the line that goes from Russia down through Iran through the Bandar Abbas port. <clears throat> My final point here is a recommendation for U.S. policy about how to deal with China. And what I'm going to really focus on here is that the United States, through its membership on the major, <clears throat> excuse me, major multilateral development banks, should be working strategically with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, 
what's Chinese dominated, on major investments to build this middle corridor. And the AIIB is making co-financing agreements with countries all around the world. Very few of them are in Central Asia, but one key model that could be one that we should follow is the TENAP project, the Trans-Anatolian Pipeline Project. This had the World Bank, the EBRD, the EIB, and the AIIB, a $2 billion investment. And the, the prongs of this were between the Asian Investment Bank and the World Bank. I think if you want to try to crowd in investment, if you want more transparency in the way China is investing, if you want higher environmental and social standards, which help the people of the region, this kind of a cooperation would create all the strategic benefits for the region and put China, make them a more, let's say, internationally reliable player on standards that this region needs to have benefits for all the people. So, okay. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Marcia. And I think your final recommendation is uh, deserving very uh, serious attention and evaluation. Uh, Jennifer, you are on the front lines of American uh, companies investing in Kazakhstan. Um, you are a part of the U.S. Chamber, uh, so you may have a broader business perspective to emerging markets uh, and uh, to other countries besides the region. Uh, please walk us through what matters today to the companies. Are they concerned uh, about the uh, sanctions that are imposed in Russia in the context of their activity in Central Asia? Uh, and how do you see the economic reform in the region, especially in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, um, facilitating or hindering our investment there. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Ariel. And as you mentioned, I work with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We are home to the U.S. Kazakhstan Business Council. Uh, we've been their home for about three years now, and, and I think it's a good way to start by telling you that we have seen an, a significant increase in U.S. corporate investment and engagement in the region. Uh, you know, this wasn't the case a few years ago. Uh, Central Asia was not as much on the map. In that sense, Ukraine and the Russian invasion of Ukraine has transformed the prism through which U.S. companies are viewing Central Asia in a positive way. Uh, we've seen over the last year in particular companies that had never contacted us about Kazakhstan or Central Asia before taking a new look at the region precisely because they're looking for new centers of growth. Uh, after operations are winding down in Russia. So we're seeing this diversification that has been so long on the agenda for different countries and U.S. interests as well. Uh, so obviously we have oil and gas and energy as a leader in the region, but there's also new agriculture projects. There are mining projects, connectivity. Uh, we see digital companies trying to increase their presence and seeing enormous opportunity across the region. Healthcare companies, logistics, uh, you know, it, it's really ex it really expands the diversification of, of trade. And throughout these, these discussions about middle corridor and trade routes. You know, we're hearing from companies really two C's about uh, Central Asia. One is connectivity and the other is climate. And I don't mean the cold weather in Astana, but the business climate. Uh, there have been enormous reforms that have been undertaken and that are projected, specifically in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, more needs to be done. We recognize the progress that is being made. But for U.S. companies to continue to engage, to increase their investments, and bring in new companies, you know, seeing the steady cadence of business climate reforms, uh, that, that includes everything from taxation, uh, different audits that companies undergo with government, just general contacts with business partners and you know, making it a, a transparent and very hospitable business climate. Uh, these 
reforms are underway and more uh, certainly are needed, but the progress that's been made is noted by U.S. companies. And in as much as uh, companies are leaving Russia, they're looking for, you know, where do they, how do they navigate things such as Eurasian Customs Union. Uh, so Russia, of course, is a member of Eurasian Customs Union, as are so many com com uh, countries in the region. Uh, there are certain challenges that have arisen because of that. And we're looking to see where U.S. government can play a, a very supportive role uh, in trade facilitation and export certificates. Uh, we think you know, the ideas that you shared, Marsha, are great ones, uh, and specifically looking at you know, can we organize a trade facilitation forum uh, and bring to life the idea that you mentioned with Boeing about a freight, uh, a freight company. That's something where US, USTR can provide its expertise and offer a way for a lot of the customs agencies and customs organizations across the region to cooperate better. We see that as a, an easy win. Uh, also, we're hearing from companies, you all probably are aware of this PNTR, Permanent Normal Trade Relations, uh, and we really need PNTR for Kazakhstan in particular because it's a WTO member. Uzbekistan is undergoing its WTO ascension. Uh, but this is just another, another one that's out there, an easy win that the U.S. can take to advance its relations, trade and otherwise, uh, with the region. Uh, we had the honor of hosting Eric in his former role and President Tokayev uh, of Kazakhstan during the UN meetings last year. And you, know, you might be surprised to hear this was one of the most successful meetings that the US private sector had during the United Nations uh, last year. We had more than 60 companies in attendance and you, know, you would go around the room and hear from the executives. And by and large, many of these executives have visited Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan was a country that they were familiar with. Central Asia was a country that many US executives are familiar with. Uh, so that may be surprising to some, but it certainly is the case of a lot of blue chip companies and increasingly some SMEs. Uh, we're seeing more interest from the smaller, medium sized companies in looking at growth opportunities in the region, something that we certainly look to encourage and why we're bringing a business delegation to Kazakhstan uh, next month. We'll be taking about 30 U.S. companies uh, to visit Kazakhstan, Almaty, Astana, coinciding with the regional forum. And we're partnering with Commerce Department on this, U.S. Commerce Department, and they're also working on a, a leg with Uzbekistan. Uh, and we increasingly hear from companies about Uzbekistan as well. It's certainly a, an emerging market in the region and one that U.S. companies are looking to do more in. Uh, and so I mentioned about this connectivity. So it's not just about connectivity through the region, but connectivity with the U.S. Um, there's flights. Many will be happy to hear flights underway uh, discussions to have a direct route from Astana to the U.S. Uh, and this would be something that would be a great development for people-to-people -people ties for more business and commerce as well, uh, looking at the this route also as a way for exports and imports. Uh, because of Kazakhstan's landlocked nature and uh, air, air travel will be a, a way to transport some of these goods. Uh, the trade between the U.S. and Kazakhstan is at historic levels of $3 billion, and we have seen this increase since after the pandemic. There was a bit of a lull, but we are now back at you know, very, very good levels. Uh, we'd also like to see this connectivity with the middle corridor, as you mentioned. Uh, this is an, an area where companies, of course, are focused on in, in moving, tr moving goods throughout the region and throughout the country. Uh, we would definitely like to see some public-private partnership uh, within this context and more engagement from U.S. organizations, be it DFC, Development Finance Corporation, uh, or other arms of the U.S. government that may be able to support uh, thinking about how we can put some financing behind and also get private sector involved uh, because they do depend on these trade routes. Uh, the other part of the connectivity, I would say, is looking at the region and not just the bilateral uh, trade. So how are you engaging other countries uh, within the region, including some of the smaller countries like Kyrgyzstan, uh, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, how does that fit into companies' overall uh, strategy in the region? 
we're seeing a lot of the American Chambers of Commerce or the AmCham's across the region looking for more U.S. engagement. And this is a great trend, uh, including from companies or from AmCham's or American Chambers that aren't officially accredited because they don't have enough U.S. companies in the country or U.S. citizens that are there. But again, this is a positive sign looking at more U.S. engagement. We're seeing them contact the chamber or some of our affiliates uh, looking to get more uh, connectivity with U.S. companies. And then back to the other point about in the business climate, uh, you know, some of these reforms that are underway and the continued dialogue with U.S. companies, uh, with the private sector about collecting feedback, be it on tax reform uh, or on different tendering requirements. You know, this type of dialogue is so important because it helps to shape the future of policies and future of business within each and every country. And I would just encourage all of the governments to keep that dialogue with U.S. companies and with multinationals open uh, because that will ultimately enhance the type of investment that you're looking to attract from companies. And companies are looking at new types of investments for the region, making hubs, uh, like we heard, be it a, a training hub uh, for providing very high quality jobs, uh, you know, livelihoods for people, uh, looking at also services, servicing hubs, new startups that are being founded and looking to be supported through U.S. companies and training. So we're seeing a lot of, a lot of engagement in these areas, and it's something that we would certainly uh, encourage the government officials to, to consider looking at uh, these enabling factors of the environment that will encourage more U.S. investment across the region. Uh, so I'll stop there, but thank you so much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. This is the gist of our business engagement with the region. Thank you for your work and thank you for your comments. Um, the message from the Kennan Institute is our virtual audience can submit questions via email to Kennan, that's K E N N A N, at Wilson Center. Dot org, Wilson Center, one word, Kennan at wilsoncenter.org, or tweet at Kennan Institute, one word, at Kennan Institute, your questions. Thank you. Uh, Eric, we've seen a panneau, a, a picture of geostrategic and geoeconomic challenges. You were eating, drinking, and sleeping it day, oh, well, not sleeping, working on it, uh, day in and day out for quite a while. From your perspective, what are the challenges and what should our policy be? Thanks, Ariel, and thanks for the invitation to join you today. Uh, I think the best place to start is with um, Vladimir Lenin, who, when he uh -oh. was talking about uh, the world revolutionary processes said that there are decades when nothing happens right. and there are weeks when decades happen. And I believe Central Asia and, and the broader world is confronting the consequences of the Russian uh, further invasion of, of Ukraine right now. And, and as we've talked about today, both directly and indirectly, um, this is causing a lot of uh, reassessment of uh, their trajectory, uh, both strategically or in the security sense and, uh, and economically. And uh, the Gallup uh, surveys just came out a couple of days ago uh, with a worldwide poll on US leadership, Russian uh, leadership, and the, the results from Kazakhstan were really striking. In 2021, 55% uh, of Kazakhs approved of Russian leadership in the world. 29% disapproved. Uh, in 2022, uh, that number who disapproved jumped from, sorry, it was 20% in 2021, jumped from 20% to 50%. So uh, there's a real popular sense that um, these countries want to redirect themselves from, from Russia, and this is manifesting in, in various ways. Um, we talked briefly about the security aspects and CSTO, which is kind of sputtering and faltering at the moment, 
and uh, maybe in a, in a death spiral. Uh, we've talked uh, a little bit about the cultural aspects of this. Ambassador Ashik Bai, I've talked about the building of national identity. Um, some people in the region have been more blunt and calling it, you know, the need for more decolonization. Uh, we've seen popular protests in favor of, of Ukraine in some of these countries and, and also things like, again, the Kazakhs um, initiated this program called the Yurts of Invincibility where they've provided people-to-people um, -people assistance to uh, Ukrainians. On the economic side, this is much more complicated as, as we've discussed today. Um, the trade ties, the geography is ma making it harder to just snap your fingers and redirect these economies uh, from their existing ties with Russia in the first place. Um, but there is you know, the consensus that diversification is essential and I think there's a determination by all these countries to uh, start moving in that direction and avoid uh, over-dependence on one partner or another. I think we also need to recognize the um, uniqueness of each country. Uh, with Kazakhstan, the, they have uh, a desire from talking to Kazakh officials, you know, they want to avoid the middle income trap, they want to avoid the resource curse, uh, and uh, they've uh, you know, adopted po policies to, to deal with that. But they also need to recognize their dependence on hydrocarbon exports. And uh, that means uh, kind of an all of the above uh, strategy where they continue to use the Northern Corridor, but they also diversify uh, to the Middle Corridor, uh, to exports through China uh, as well. Uh, Uzbekistan faces different challenges. Um, their officials tell us that you know, every year they have something like 700,000 new entrants into the job force every year. Um, so providing employment is a major priority for them, uh, attracting investment, uh, and taking advantage of their large domestic market uh, is uh, another uh, priority for them. And I think they've, they've, they've shown uh, the ability with the textile industry to uh, do more of the processing in country. They've also taken great strides internationally by um, working on with the, the cotton campaign to uh, get out from under the cloud that, that they had been under because of their labor practices. So, you know, we've said uh, many times today that, you know, you can't change geography, um, but regional integration uh, is a key thing that the Central Asians can do more of that will help them uh, improve their ability to negotiate between uh, their two uh, very large uh, and influential neighbors. And this is true of you know, water markets, energy markets, agriculture, uh, labor markets, and uh, the ability to harmonize the movement of all these goods and services will make Central Asia more uh, cohesive and stronger in its uh, ability to relate to the outside world. And this is where I think the, we can pivot to U.S. policy. As, as Lisa said, um, the C5 plus one uh, was, has, was and has been the cornerstone of how we've approached the region. And I want to quote from the um, strategy that, that Lisa mentioned, uh, and we say that the United States needs to emphasize cooperation in those areas where it, the United States, has a comparative advantage, particularly to promote private sector engagement and transparent government policies and regulations that foster adherence to international standards, including environmental standards. And this gets to what Fred was talking about, the, the need to take advantage of, of 
uh, the ability to uh, introduce Western values and, and to raise the standards of these uh, countries so their investment climates are more open to U.S. Uh, goods and services and investment, but also uh, that they uh, take seriously the value proposition so that, as you said, there, there isn't just an un, uninterrupted uh, series of authoritarian countries uh, throughout this part of, of Asia. So our, our policies, our programs have focused on a number of areas. We focused on trade. I, I'm pleased to see that trade within Central Asia has doubled in the last five years. And with the outside world, it's also grown dramatically. And we've supported the harmonization of customs and border procedures and private sector connectivity. Uh, we've also encouraged the small and medium enterprises from taking a look at Central Asia, and this trade mission is, is a, a prime example of that. Um, we also have um, Power Central Asia, and, and hopefully Jeff will talk more about this in his remarks, um, where we want to uh, improve Central Asia's uh, uh, connectivity, their regulatory reform and liberalization, and to encourage more clean energy investment uh, so that uh, Central Asia can indeed be a leader, as, as Marcia suggested. Um, and then tech, we also see promising uh, uh, signs of uh, new companies forming, uh, including export-oriented uh, companies. Uh, and we've seen uh, tech parks uh, develop in uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and it's also become a hub for some digital nomads, including from Russia. And so their export revenues are also uh, uh, growing rapidly. And, and again, the US has a role to play given uh, you know, the experience we have with, with, uh, with the technology sector and the investment that we can introduce. Um, agriculture, again, uh, I mentioned the cotton campaign. Uh, our um, AID programs also focus on kind of the, the ability of smaller farmers to connect with each other and again to open the barriers between these countries to facilitate some of the trade that uh, the ambassadors mentioned earlier. And then um, finally, I would point to strategic minerals as another potential opportunity. Uh, Kazakhstan has copper, in fact, 5% of the world's uh, supplies, cobalt, uh, lithium, nickel, and aluminum. Uh, Uzbekistan has cobalt, nickel, copper also. And this is uh, going to be a key element as uh, countries develop uh, electronic vehicles. Uh, the need for all these elements is essential for uh, battery production. Uh, and it's also important that um, many of the, of the Western producers of electronic vehicles uh, will be looking for uh, materials that have pr been produced in a sustainable way environmentally and socially and from the standpoint of labor rights. So countries that are now coming to this market have an opportunity to distinguish themselves and to add value uh, on these important ESG uh, qualities. So to sum up, um, since the con these countries became independent in 91, we've seen a number of pivot points that have been mentioned today, 9-11, uh, uh, the development of hydrocarbon exports in uh, Kazakhstan in particular, uh, events in Afghanistan, and now the Ukraine war. And in the background of these uh, dramatic events, we've also had some mega trends, principally the rise of China and its influence uh, growing, uh, particularly in the region, but throughout the world economy and the increasing effects of climate change on our economies, on our, our weather patterns, on migration patterns. And 
when we look to um, how Central Asia will relate to these challenges to the United States and to other powers, um, I think one of the next big things is the energy transition. And um, uh, I mentioned the um, uh, electric uh, vehicles as, a, as that supply chain is going to be essential. Um, other speakers have talked about Kazakhstan's role in developing renewables um, and also developing and being, being a, supply, uh, a reliable supplier of fossil fuels as the world goes through this transition. So I'll just leave, leave it there with uh, those food, um, uh, elements of food for thought uh, and uh, hopefully as a transition into Jeff's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for our excellent panelists. Um, I would point, it, point out two things. Number one, um, my colleague Wes uh, Hill and I are working on a report uh, on uh, rare earth. Uh, China is mining 60% of the rare earth around the world and refining close to 90%. This is unsustainable for our supply chains, especially in view of the tensions uh, in Asia Pacific and elsewhere. Uh, so that report is coming out uh, from the New Lines Institute soon. Uh, and secondly, I did not have any questions from the audience unless the Wilson Center, the uh, Kennedy Institute is correcting me and telling me that there are. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean from the internet, uh, any uh, questioners who identified themselves. We had some anonymous <laughs> questions. But if we have questions here, let's start. Yes, please introduce yourself. Uh, John O'Keefe. Uh, John. Yeah, thank you. Uh, John O'Keefe. Uh, one of the issues that hasn't been discussed but which is, I think, something important in the short term, is the issue of migration. Uh, and it is uh, two ways. Uh, well, actually, it's one way, but different groups. Uh, employment and the need for labor in Russia is diminishing, and therefore, there are a lot of people from Central Asia who are coming back home, uh, which creates certain kinds of stresses. The other migration, which Eric actually mentioned, was the movement of young Russians with technical skills to these countries. Uh, and I, I believe there's been a jump in GDP for several of these countries, perhaps because of that influx of, t of technical experts. And so for the panel, whoever would like to address this question, how do you see this playing out both, both in terms of potential economic growth, but also a kind of instability if you have a number of people coming back looking for jobs and don't have one. Thank you. And I would add for the panel that uh, we have uh, six minutes left for the concluding keynote. Who has arrived? Thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, uh, I would ask the panelists to keep it short. Thank you. Okay, I can answer this quickly. Sure. The feedback that we're receiving from... Uh, Mike. The feedback that we're receiving no, no. from uh, companies. Button. No, it's on. It's on. Oh, it's on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll speak a little louder as well. <laughs> but the feedback that we're receiving directly from companies is that the inbound migration of Russians and also Ukrainians, by the way, is a different type of skill set and different uh, different companies. So it's not replacing employment from the region. It's additive. So hence some of the economic growth. Uh, it was also my impression that the migration has been sustained in Russia to a degree because of the high ruble. So there's a demand to 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 work there, and I haven't seen recently, but I think there, it hasn't gone down significantly. Uh -huh. But it does present a problem if they do come back in big numbers because employment is needed in uh, for them when they return. So that's a very fair point. Ambassador Mann. Thank you very much. Uh, um, this year, I'm celebrating my silver anniversary of working on the Tappy Pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, 
Let me offer just brief constructive, constructive dissent for Fred and a question for the panel. Um, on TAPI, the, uh, there have been three uh, super major energy companies, Exxon, Shell, and Chevron, that set up offices and tried to make the project work. And it failed because Turkmenistan will not permit any country, any companies but Chinese to take upstream positions. And you can't do it as a company if you can't book the reserves. The TAPI structure also of four independent pipeline operating companies and financing is impossible. And I'd say finally, there's a third point, which is the Taliban now make any uh, Western investment in a pipeline like that radioactive. But on the wider issue of investment climate, leaving Kazakhstan out of it, which has, which has cracked the code, um, with the other countries, are there any actual um, real changes in investment conditions for foreign companies that you've seen or are there in prospect? Yeah, I can jump in and say certainly with, with uh, Uzbekistan, we have certainly seen an improvement uh, with the new leadership, much more forward looking. Uh, the leadership is also looking to host many global fora events. EBRD has something coming up, I think next month, and they're looking to showcase the improvements of the business climate to the US business community, international business community. I would just like to add a constraint that has been told to me by several major companies, and that is the quality of human capital. If you're looking for people to work on higher value end investments, um, they're finding difficulty finding that labor locally. Um, yes, sir. Can I? Can I, can oh, I, I, very briefly. Okay, briefly. And I, I agree with Steve. On the other hand, uh, this has uh, nine lives, and and we hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think the engagement of, of very serious folks in the Middle East on this is, is something quite new, and we'll see where it goes. My point is not that that is going to happen, but that there are very serious and sustained Ser en engagements from every country in Central Asia with the Taliban. It's not going to go away. The United States has no strategy on dealing with this. It should. It seems to me the Central Asians are doing us a favor by scoping out the situation on the ground in many areas and that we should work with them, not on them. Excellent point. Uh, one question from here, and we will also, because we are one minute literally, have a question from Mr. Rajendra Singh, Senior Digital Development Specialist at the World Bank, and his question is, uh, how to strengthen digital connectivity of land-linked Central Asian countries? So I suggest the panel answer that question and the last question from the audience, please yeah, go ahead. I, I'm, uh, so in a panel called Beyond Hydrocarbons, where we're talking about strategic minerals, I'm surprised I didn't hear about uranium, uh, which uh, in, a, in a world in which um, we are no longer selling oil or gas uh, and we were thinking of other sources, um, one of the really important things is that Kazakhstan um, looks like it's kind of the Saudi Arabia of uranium. Um, how do we include that fuel cycle uh, and dependency on Russian fuel rods uh, in, 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 in a post-hydrocarbon world. I just throw that out. Maybe that's another conference we can have. And I will, uh, it's not just another conference, it's our uh, report that ca just came out last week. I'm glad you asked that question. It's in the report, came out by the, uh, published by the Atlantic Council, uh, co-authored by Margarita Asenova, Wes and myself, and please read it. There are copies available, and it's available online uh, at the Atlantic Council Eurasia Center. Uh, now to the panel. 
on the internet connectivity, I think Starlink and uh, would be satellite internet would be a good choice uh, to look at too. Is Starlink to, a member of your? No, they're not. Well, but but they I'm just be. saying a satellite, um, satellite based internet because of the, the large land mass. Why, why hasn't this been on the agenda of C5 plus one? It's one of 10 topics we could con put together here today that would be tremendously valuable for the Central Asians in all their priorities, but would exactly mesh with ours and businesses. We C5 plus one has to, we have to start it over and, and take it seriously for once as we've failed to do, and they have to collect ideas ahead, and they have to get the right people in the room, and no more of this blah, blah, blah. Um, if I can make a suggestion, I don't know if you know there's a B5 plus one that's been buzzing. Uh, it hasn't formed yet, but we'd love to invite you or your organization to join the upcoming business mission, and together we can develop a report for B5 plus one. Well, I, it's the... It's not the right group. I mean, we need to time to, all this Transcaspian stuff, and no one has followed the obvious suggestion made here this morning to to include Azerbaijan at least. But but honestly, this is this the discussion at this point is not about unknowns in Central Asia. Uh, it's about unknowns here. <laughs> Well, and that uh, is something that our keynote speaker, who is an accomplished diplomat, was um, deputy chief of mission in India, um, ambassador to Ukraine, ambassador to Greece. I cannot think of anyone more qualified to uh, talk on issues that we cover today here. Energy beyond hydrocarbons, uh, the Russian invasion of U reinvasion of Ukraine, uh, the rise of China in Central Asia and elsewhere. Jeff, the floor is yours. <laughs> so good to have you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Um, it's wonderful to see so many colleagues here. I feel a little bit like the prodigal son uh, coming back to a family that I was part of until nine years ago, and it's wonderful to see so many old colleagues. Uh, Lisa, Steve Mann, my predecessor is SCA, PDAS, Eric, Ariel, of course, John, Alan, um, I could go on and on. Um, I want to make a couple of observations. First, let me note um, how delighted I am to be here speaking also uh, with Ambassador Ashikbayev. Um, he was the first foreign ambassador I met with once I was sworn into office in this role in September. I think I've probably met with more senior Kazakh officials than any other government other than maybe Ukraine um, since I moved back to Maine State. And one of the reasons for that, as I said to Deputy Foreign Minister Kairat Umarov uh, just last week, is that there are few countries that bring together all of the issues that I am responsible for as perfectly as Kazakhstan does. That is to say, Kazakhstan is a key partner in our global energy security agenda, uh, contributes about 1% of global crude oil at a moment when we need every barrel that we can find that's not coming from Russia. Um, it is a country that have, has extraordinary potential for renewables, um, as Eric alluded to. You know, I can remember my, my first time driving from um, Almaty to, to Bishkek, and it, you know, it looks so much like driving in the high plains of Colorado, which, by the way, is one of our largest renewable power states in the U.S. right now. Um, it is also a country, um, as uh, was just pointed out by Eric, that has extraordinary resources in terms of critical minerals at a moment when the world needs all the critical mineral supplies that it can find. Um, and it is a country, as the question just pointed out, that has plentiful um, resources. Uh, first of all, a very important legacy on civil nuclear issues, um, which I, I know vividly from my time working with Ambassador Kazikhan at the IAEA in, in Vienna. Of course, we worked together uh, to create the IEA fuel bank in, in Kazakhstan. 
and it is a country that is poised to play an even larger role in the global uh, civil nuclear picture at a moment when we as the G7 are committed to uh, de-risking ourselves from uh, Russian energy sources, and when the area of uh, greatest um, uh, scope for further action at this point is, is how we de-risk ourselves from Ross Adam. So um, I'm really delighted to be here. I'll make a couple of observations to begin with, coming back to this conversation. Uh, the first is just how satisfying it has been for me to see how um, even as the sort of core mantra of U.S. policy towards Central Asia, our support for the sovereignty, territorial integrity of, of the, the countries remains, we've built up a much, rich, a much richer institutional partnership. Um, Steve knows this. I mean, I, we are in a profession where you sort of put your oar in for a couple of years, you row as hard as you can, and you hand it off to the next person, and you hope that they keep going. But it's, it was encouraging for me to see um, you know, how committed Secretary Blinken is to the C5 plus one structure, uh, the fact that he was back in, uh, in Kazakhstan just a few, few weeks ago, um, meeting with all of our partners from the region. We just had our Turkmenistan ABCs last week with Foreign Minister Muradov here. Uh, so we are taking this region very, very seriously at a moment when, as Eric pointed out, everything has been changed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And the, the message that that has sent about Vladimir Putin's revanchist agenda, but also the impact that it has had on the Central Asians themselves uh, as they think about their place in the global economy. Something that, else, uh, something that has changed um, as, I, as I came back to these issues, of course, is China. Um, I can remember you know, when I was visiting um, Ashgabat 10 years ago, People were just talking about the Chinese investment in pipelines. Uh, today, 75% of Turkmenistan's gas resources go into a pipeline to China. Um, and that, of course, has significant implications uh, for Kazakhstan's strategic, or excuse me, for Turkmenistan's strategic direction. Um, and China, of course, is a significant factor across the wider region. Um, in this context, I would commend to everybody, if you have not seen it, um, Jake Sullivan's remarks last week at the Brookings Institution, which are a really important articulation of the administration's approach to de-risking our relationship with China, uh, but also provide, um, as one would expect from Jake, uh, a fairly candid window into some of the policy debates that are going on right now about how we think about our continued engagement with China, and, and I was pleased to see in his remarks the very strong focus on the, the critical minerals issues that that um, uh, that, uh, that we that we just talked about that Eric flagged up. Um, so we have a lot that is going on across the region. I would flag two uh, big externalities as well. Um, one is the. Uh, the role of Russia itself, and in particular the Russian oil and gas sector, and I have spent a lot of time in my first year in this role talking to governments around the world about um, fossil fuel energy security um, and how to deal with the weaponization of Russia's oil and gas resources. The aspect of this conversation that I don't think has gotten enough attention is what it means for Russia itself um, that a country which gets most of its budget from oil and gas is project, projected by the IEA to have its oil and gas revenues down by 50%, 50 percent, five zero, by 2030. Uh, this, it's an extraordinary uh, turn of events, and it is a reminder that while we've all spent years and years talking about European energy security and Europe's vulnerability to dependence, former vulnerability to dependence on, on Russia, we sometimes overlook the other side of the equation, which was Russia's dependence on Europe as a market, which they have now lost and, and lost forever. And, and I say that in part based on a lot of travel to Europe uh, and based on participation three weeks ago with Secretary Blinken in the, the first session of the US-EU Energy Council since the invasion of Ukraine, where it was very clear from our European allies that there is going to be no return to business as usual regardless of how the war in, uh, in Ukraine is eventually settled. The other, however, is the climate crisis. And I think um, I have been impressed talking to counterparts from Central Asia um, 
by the reminder that all of them have provided me of, of how vulnerable Central Asia itself is to the effects of the climate crisis. So this is not an abstraction. Um, in the SC wor SCA world, of course, um, Pakistan is probably the foremost example of that. We all saw the terrible flooding last year. I, I was back in Islamabad um, uh, about uh, six weeks ago, had a long session with Prime Minister Sharif. Uh, Steve, you'll be glad to know that he's still talking about TAPI. Um, but, uh, you know, these are countries for whom uh, climate change and the climate crisis is not an abstraction. You see that in the, the mountainous countries of Central Asia, um, whose um, uh, access to hydropower is at risk um, as mountain glaciers are melting, but also the implications that has for agriculture, for cash crops like cotton, for food and food security. Um, so there is a strong interest that I have found um, across the region in working with the United States, working with U.S. companies um, on uh, these issues of, uh, of uh, climate change and in particular how to uh, address the region's understandable energy requirements in the most sustainable way possible. Um, I was particularly impressed um, in Istanbul, I had the opportunity at an EBRD conference to meet jointly with the Deputy Ener Energy Ministers of Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. Um, and I was particularly impressed by the Uzbek. I would not have predicted when I left SCA that Uzbekistan would become the foremost champion of energy transition in Central Asia, but this is a country that has committed itself to 25% renewable power by 2030 which is an admirable level of ambition. Uh, one issue that has been a priority for me, for Secretary Blinken, for Secretary Kerry, in our dialogue with Kazakhstan has been, um, has been methane. Uh, because Kazakhstan is a, a major and, and highly professional fossil fuel country, uh, it is also a country which has not yet signed the Global Methane Pledge. Um, I was encouraged by my discussions um, last week with Deputy Foreign Minister Umarov that we're making progress in that dialogue, which we've also conducted in Houston with the Energy Minister, with Ambassador Kazikam when he was here in Washington, D.C., uh, because this is a really important opportunity, I think, to both um, highlight uh, Kazakhstan's international role, the responsible position that it's already staked out, for instance, on issues around um, fossil fuel uh, reliability its um, admirable decisions on, on how to manage its, its nuclear and uranium resources. Uh, so this is something that we hope very much we'll be able to work together on. I would also emphasize in my engagements with, in particular with some of our IOCs, um, how seriously all of our companies take their partnership with Kazakhstan. Um, it is a country in which uh, companies like um, Chevron and ExxonMobil uh, have invested tens of billions of dollars. Uh, they are quite serious about that investment. They are continuing to grow that investment. Um, they also are all watching very carefully the vulnerability uh, that arises from uh, our collective reliance on CPC, a pipeline uh, which is the, the principal exit uh, point for Kazakh crude to global markets, um, an important source of supply, especially for a couple of key European allies. Uh, so we are very, very interested in the continued um, operation of that pipeline, which I should emphasize is not, is not affected by U.S. sanctions. Um, we have worked very closely with Treasury so that everybody understands that, that the, the crude oil, which comes from Kazakhstan through the CPC pipeline and through Russia, is not sanctionable. Um, but we have also been pleased, and this goes back to Eric's time in government, uh, that we have been able to, to work with our Kazakh and Azeri partners uh, to begin developing uh, some alternative routes. There is more that can be done, um, working with the, the BTC pipeline, working with SUPSA. Um, I will be in Baku um, at the end of this month, continuing that conversation. We see this at this stage as largely a commercial transaction between SOCAR and KMG, but it's a commercial transaction that enjoys the strong support of the United States. Um, I'd love to, if we've got time, Ariel, I'd, I'd love to take a couple of minutes for questions and answers, if that would be of interest. But wh what, what I would emphasize to everybody is 
uh, the degree to which for me and my team in the ENR Bureau, um, Central Asia is a priority. Kazakhstan has been an extraordinarily uh, gracious and positive interlocutor uh, for me in this new role, but also for the Bureau. Um, I am personally committed to the, the reinvigoration of the U.S.-Kazakhstan Strategic Energy Dialogue, um, which is a joint undertaking of state and the Department of Energy, which sort of fell by the wayside for a couple of years, and, and I, we will change that in 2023. On that, Ambassador, you have my, my, my firm promise. Um, but I'm also very interested in the issues that, that Jennifer raised uh, around how to leverage the business relationship. Uh, Fred properly put a spotlight on regional connectivity, and, and I would just say in this regard, you know, thinking back to my PDAS role, um, how valuable the asset of the U.S. Consulate in Almaty and the regional AID office and the regional programs that run, are run out of that office on energy and other issues are. And I think as I, I reflect on the C5 plus one that I joined with Secretary Blinken back in, uh, back in, in uh, September at the UNGA, and as I look to the future, uh, there will be a very receptive audience from the Secretary's team, from myself, from Don, uh, from Salman, and the others of us who are involved in this enterprise uh, for exactly these kind of business-facing uh, business engagements, because it's very much part of what we're trying to do with Kazakhstan, but it's also what we've been discussing with the Turkmen, with the Uzbeks, with many others. So thank you very much, Ariel, for inviting me back. Um, it's great to be back with the family and uh, look forward to a little bit of a conversation. Thank you so much. I couldn't think of a better speaker to wrap this up. I want to thank all the ambassadors, current and uh, retired, uh, every speaker on the panel and everybody in the audience. I want particularly to thank uh, Will Pomerantz and his excellent staff. A terrific event. Will, please wrap it up and give us the green light for lunch. There's a green light for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>